Canto the First, The Spleen. One. My uncle's goodness is extreme, if seriously he hath disease. He hath acquired the world's esteem and nothing more important sees. A paragon of virtue, he. But what a nuisance it will be, chained to his bedside night and day, without a chance to slip away. Ye need dissimulation base, a dying man with art to soothe, beneath his head the pillow smooth, and physic bring with mournful face, to sigh and meditate alone, when will the devil take his own? 2. Thus mused a madcap young, who drove through clouds of dust at postal pace, by the decree of mighty Jove, inheritor of all his race. Friends of Louis Mila and Ruslan, let me present ye to the man, who without more prevarication the hero is of my narration. Onegin, O oh my gentle readers, was born beside the Neva. Where it may be ye were born, or there have shown as one of fashion's leaders, I also wandered there of old, but cannot stand the northern cold. 3. Having performed his service truly, deep into debt his father ran. Three balls a year he gave ye duly, at last became a ruined man. But Eugene was by fate preserved, for first Madame his wants observed, and then Monsieur supplied her place. The boy was wild, but full of grace. Monsieur Le Abbe, a starving Gaul, fearing his pupil to annoy, instructed jestingly the boy morality taught scarce at all gently for pranks he would reprove and in the summer gardens rove four when youth's rebellious hour drew near then my eugene the path must trace the path of hope and tender fear monsieur clean out of doors they chase lo my onegin free as air cropped in the latest style his hair dressed like a london dandy he the giddy world at last shall see he wrote and spoke so all aloud in the french language perfectly danced the mazurkas gracefully without the least constraint he bowed what more is required the world replies he is a charming youth and wise five we all of us of education a something somehow have obtained. Thus, praised be God, a reputation with us is easily attained. Onegin was, so many deemed, unerring critics self-esteemed, pedantic, although scholar-like. In truth he had the happy trick without constraint in conversation of touching lightly every theme. Silent, oracular ye'd see him amid a serious disputation, then suddenly discharge a joke, the lady's laughter, to provoke. 6. Latin is just now not in vogue, but if the truth I must relate, Onegin knew enough, the rogue, a mild quotation to translate, a little juvenile to spout, with veil, finish off a note, two verses he could recollect of the Aeneid, but incorrect. In history he took no pleasure, the dusty chronicles of earth for him were but of little worth, yet still of anecdotes a treasure within his memory there lay, from Romulus unto our day. 7. For empty sound the rascal swore he existence would not make a curse, knew not an I am from a chore, although we read him heaps of verse. Homer, Theocritus, he jeered, but Adam Smith, to read appeared, and at economy was great. That is, he could elucidate how empire's store of wealth unfold, how flourish, why and wherefore less if the new raw product they possess the medium is required of gold. The father scarcely understands his son, and mortgages his lands. 8. But upon all that Eugene knew I have no leisure here to dwell but say he was a genius who in one thing really did excel. It occupied him from a boy, a labor, torment, yet a joy, 
it whiled his idle hours away and wholly occupied his day. The amatory science warm, which Ovid once immortalized, for which the poet agonized laid down his life of sun and storm on the steps of Moldavia alone, far from Italy, his own. 9. How soon he learnt deception's art, hope to conceal, and jealousy, false confidence or doubt to impart, sombre or glad in turn to be, haughty appear, subservient, obsequious or indifferent. What languor would his silence show, how full of fire his speech would glow, how artless was the note which spoke of love again and yet again. How deftly he could transport fain, how bright and tender was his look, modest yet daring, and a tear would at the proper time appear. 10. How well he played the greenhorn's part to cheat the inexperienced fair, sometimes by pleasing flattery's art, sometimes by ready-made despair. The feeble moment would espy of tender years, the modesty conquer by passion and address, await the long-delayed caress. A vow, then, t'was time to pray, attentive to the heart's first beating. Follow up love, a secret meeting arrange without the least delay. Then, then, well, in some solitude lessons to give he understood. 11. How soon he learnt to titillate the heart of the inveterate flirt desirous to annihilate his own antagonist's expert, how bitterly he would malign, with many a snare their pathway line. But ye, O oh happy husbands, ye with him were friends eternally. The crafty spouse caressed him, who by fabulous in his youth was schooled, and the suspicious veteran old, the pompous, swaggering cuckold, too, who floats contentedly through life, proud of his dinners, and his wife. 12. One morn, whilst yet in bed he lay, his valet brings him letters three. What? Invitations? The same day as many entertainments be. A ball here, there a children's treat. Whither shall my rapscallion flit? Whither shall he go first? He'll see. Perchance he will to all the three. Meantime, in matutinal dress and hat surnamed a boulevard, he hies unto the boulevard, to loiter there in idleness until the sleepless Brajot chime announcing to him dinner time. 13. Tis dark. He seats him in a sleigh. Drive on, the cheerful cry goes forth. His furs are powdered on the way by the fine silver of the north. He bends his course to Talon's, where he knows Caverin will repair. He enters. High the cork arose, and comet champagne foaming flows. Before him red roast beef is seen, and truffles, dear to youthful eyes, flanked by immortal Strasbourg pies, the choicest flowers of French cuisine, and limber cheese alive and old is seen next pineapples of gold. 14. Still thirst, fresh draughts of wine compels to cool the cutlet seething grease, when the sonorous bourgeois tells of the commencement of the piece. A critic of the stage malicious, a slave of actresses capricious. Onegin was a citizen of the domains of the side scene. To the theatre he repairs where each young critic ready stands, capers applauds with clap of hands, with hisses Cleopatra scares, Moina recalls for this alone, that all may hear his voice's tone. 15. Thou fairyland, where formerly shone pungent satyr's dauntless king, von Winzine, friend of liberty, and Knejine, apt at copying. The young Simeonova, too, there with Ozerov was wont to share applause, the people's donative, there our Caterine did revive Corneille's majestic genius. Sarcastic Chatshoskoy brought out his comedies, a noisy rout. There Didelot became glorious. There, 
there, beneath the side scene's shade, the drama of my youth was played. 16. My goddesses, where are your shades? Do ye not hear my mournful sighs? Are ye replaced by other maids who cannot conjure former joys? Shall I, your chorus here anew, Russia's terpsichore review again in her ethereal dance? Or will my melancholy glance on the dull stage find all things changed, the disenchanted glass direct where I can no more recollect? A careless looker-on estranged, in silence shall I sit and yawn and dream of life's delightful dawn? 17. The house is crammed. A thousand lamps on pit, stalls, boxes, brightly blaze. Impatiently the gallery stamps. The curtain now they slowly raise. Obedient to the magic strings. Brilliant. Ethereal. There springs forth from the crowd of nymphs surrounding is Tomina the nimbly bounding, with one foot resting on its tip slow circling round its fellow swings. And now she skips, and now she springs, like down from Aeolus's lip. Now her lithe form she arches o'er and beats with rapid foot the floor. 18. Shouts of applause. Onegin passes between the stalls, along the toes. Seated, a curious look with glasses on unknown female forms he throws. Free scope he yields unto his glance, reviews both dress and countenance, with all dissatisfaction shows. To male acquaintances he bows, and finally he deigns let fall upon the stage his weary glance. He yawns, averts his countenance, exclaiming, We must change em all. I long by ballets have been bored. Now Didelot scarce can be endured. 19. Snakes, satyrs, loves with many a shout Across the stage still madly sweep, Whilst the tired serving men without Wrapped in their sheepskins soundly sleep. Still the loud stamping doth not cease, Still they blow noses, cough, and sneeze, Still everywhere, without, within, the lamps illuminating shine. The steed benumbed still pawing stands, And of the irksome harness tires. And still the coachmen round the fires Abuse their masters, rub their hands. But Eugene long hath left the press To array himself in evening dress. 20. Faithfully shall I now depict Portray the solitary den wherein the child of fashion strict dressed him, undressed and dressed again. All that industrial London brings for tallow, wood, and other things across the Baltic's salt sea waves, all which caprice and affluence craves, all which in Paris eager taste, choosing a profitable trade, for our amusement ever made and ease and fashionable waste, adorn the apartment of Eugene, philosopher. Just turned eighteen. Twenty one. China and bronze, the tables wait. Amber on pipes from Stamboul glows. And joy of souls effeminate. Files of crystal scents enclose. Combs of all sizes, files of steel. Scissors both straight and curved as well. Of thirty different sorts. Lo! Brushes both for the nails and for the tushes, or so I would remark in passing, could not conceive how serious Grimm dared calmly cleanse his nails for him. Eloquent raver, all surpassing the friend of liberty and laws, in this case quite mistaken was. Twenty two. The most industrious man alive may yet be studious of his nails. What boots it with the age to strive? Custom the despot soon prevails. A new caverine, Eugene, mine, Dreading the world's remarks malign, Was that which we are wont to call a fop, In dress pedantical. Three mortal hours per diem He would loiter by the looking-glass, And from his dressing-room would pass Like Venus when, capriciously, 
the goddess would a masquerade attend in male attire arrayed. 23. On this artistical retreat, having once fixed your interest, I might to connoisseurs repeat the style in which my hero dressed. Though I confess, I hardly dare describe in detail the affair, since words like pantaloons, vest, coat, to ruse indigenous are not, and also that my feeble verse, pardon I ask for such a sin, with words of foreign origin too much I'm given to intersperse, though to the academy I come, and oft its dictionary thumb. 24. But such is not my project now. So let us to the ballroom haste, whither at headlong speed doth go Eugene in hackney carriage placed. Past darkened windows and long streets of slumbering citizens he fleets, till carriage lamps, a double row, Cast a gay lustre on the snow which shines with iridescent hues. He nears a spacious mansion's gate, by many a lamp illuminate, And through the lofty windows views profiles of lovely dames he knows, And also fashionable beau. 25. Our hero stops and doth alight, Flies past the porter to the stair, But, ere he mounts the marble flight, with hurried hand smooths down his hair. He enters. In the hall a crowd, no more the music thunders loud, some a mazurka occupies, crushing and a confusing noise. Spurs of the cavalier guard clash, the feet of graceful ladies fly, and following them ye might espy full many a glance like lightning flash, and by the fiddle's rushing sound, the voice of jealousy is drowned. 26. In my young days of wild delight, on balls I madly used to dote. Fond declarations they invite, or the delivery of a note. So hearken, every worthy spouse, I would your vigilance arouse. Attentive be unto my rhymes, and do precautions take betimes. Ye mothers, also, caution use, upon your daughters keep an eye, employ your glasses constantly, for otherwise, God only knows, I lift a warning voice because I long have ceased to offend the laws. 27. Alas, life's hours which swiftly fly I've wasted in amusements vain, but were it not immoral I should dearly like to dance again. I love its furious delight, the crowd of merriment and light, the ladies, their fantastic dress, also their feet. Yet nevertheless, scarcely in Russia can ye find three pairs of handsome female feet. Ah, I still struggle to forget a pair, though desolate my mind. Their memory lingers still and seems to agitate me in my dreams. 28. When, where, and in what desert land, madman, wilt thou from memory raise those feet? Alas, on what far strand do ye of spring the blossoms graze? Lapped in your eastern luxury, no trace ye left in passing by upon the dreary northern snows, but better love the soft repose of splendid carpets richly wrought. I once forgot for your sweet cause the thirst for fame and man's applause. My country and an exile's lot. My joy in youth was fleeting e'en as your light footprints on the green. 29. Diana's bosom, Flora's cheeks, are admirable, my dear friend. But ye Terpsichore bespeaks charms more endearing in the end. For promises her feet reveal of untold gain she must conceal. Their privileged allurements fire a hidden train of wild desire. I love them, O oh my dear Elvine, beneath the tablecloth of white, in winter on the fender bright, in springtime on the meadows green upon the ballroom's glassy floor, or by the ocean's rocky shore. 30. 
Beside the stormy sea one day I envied sore the billows tall, Which rushed in eager dense array Enamoured at her feet to fall. How like the billow I desired To kiss the feet which I admired! No, never in the early blaze Of fiery youth's untutored days So ardently did I desire A young Armida's lips to press, Her cheeks of rosy loveliness, Or bosom full of languid fire, a gust of passion never tore my spirit with such pangs before. 31. Another time, so willed it fate, immersed in secret thought I stand and grasp a stirrup fortunate, her foot was in my other hand. Again imagination blazed, the contact of the foot I raised rekindled in my withered heart the fires of passion and its smart, Away, and cease to ring their praise, for ever with thy tattling lyre, the proud ones are not worth the fire of passion they so often raise. The words and looks of charmers sweet are oft deceptive, like their feet. 32. Where's Onegin? Half asleep, straight from the ball to bed he goes, whilst Petersburg from slumber deep the drum already doth arouse. The shopman and the peddler rise, and to the burst the cabman plies. The octenka with pitcher speeds, crunching the morning snow she treads. Morning awakes with joyous sound. The shutters open. To the skies in column blue the smoke doth rise. The German baker looks around his shop, a nightcap on his head, and pauses oft to serve out bread. 33. By turning morning into night, Tired by the ball's incessant noise, The votary of vain delight Sleep in the shadowy couch enjoys, Late in the afternoon to rise, When the same life before him lies Till morn, life uniform but gay, Tomorrow, just like yesterday. But was our friend Eugene content, Free in the bosom of his spring, Amid successes flattering a pleasure's daily bandishment, Or vainly mid luxurious fare was he in health, or void of care. 34. Even so, his passion soon abated, Hateful the hollow world became, Nor long his mind was agitated by love's inevitable flame. For treachery had done its worst, Friendship and friends he likewise cursed, because he could not gourmandize daily beefsteaks and Strasbourg pies and irrigate them with champagne. No slander viciously could spread whene'er he had an aching head. And, though a plucky scatterbrain, he finally lost all delight in bullets, sabers, and in fight. 35. His malady, whose cause I ween it now to investigate his time, was nothing but the British spleen transported to our Russian clime. It gradually possessed his mind. Though, God be praised, he ne'er designed to slay himself with blade or ball, indifferent he became to all, and like child Harold gloomily he to the festival repairs, nor Boston, nor the world's affairs, nor tender glance, nor amorous sigh, impressed him in the least degree. Callous to all he seemed to be. 36. Ye miracles of courtly grace, he left you first, and I must own the manners of the highest class have latterly vexatious grown. And though perchance a lady may discourse on Bentham or of Say, yet as a rule their talk I call harmless, but quite nonsensical, then they're so innocent of vice, so full of piety, correct, so prudent, and so circumspect, stately, devoid of prejudice, so inaccessible to men, their looks alone produce the spleen. 37. And you, my youthful damsels fair, whom latterly one often meets urging your droshkies swift as air along St. Petersburg's paved streets, from you too Eugene took flight, 
abandoning insane delight, and isolated from all men, yawning betook him to a pen. He thought to write, but labor long inspired him with disgust, and so naught from his pen did ever flow, and thus he never fell among that vicious set whom I don't blame, because a member I became. 38. Once more to idleness consigned, he felt the laudable desire from mere vacuity of mind the wit of others to acquire. A case of books he doth obtain, he reads at random, reads in vain. This nonsense, that dishonest seems, this wicked, that absurd he deems. All are constrained, and fetters bear, antiquity no pleasures gave, the moderns of the ancients rave. Books he abandoned like the fair, his bookshelf instantly doth drape with taffety instead of crape. 39. Having abjured the haunts of men, like him renouncing vanity, his friendship I acquired just then. His character attracted me. An innate love of meditation, original imagination, a cool sagacious mind he had. I was incensed, and he was sad. Both were of passion satiate, and both of dull existence tired extinct the flame which once had fired. Both were expectant of the hate with which blind fortune oft betrays the very morning of our days. 40. He who hath lived and living, thinks, must e'en despise his kind at last. He who hath suffered oft time shrinks from shades of the relentless past. No fond illusions live to soothe, but memory like a serpent's tooth, with late remembrance gnaws and stings. All this in many cases brings a charm with it in conversation. Onegin's speeches I abhorred at first, but soon became inured to the sarcastic observation, to witticism and taunts half vicious, and gloomy epigrams malicious. 41. How oft, when on a summer night, transparent o'er the Neva beamed the firmament in mellow light, and when the watery mirror gleamed no more with pale Diana's rays, we called to mind our youthful days, the days of love and of romance. Then would we muse as in a trance, impressionable for an hour, and breathe the balmy breath of night. And like the prisoners, our delight, who for the greenwood quits his tower, as on the rapid wings of thought, the early days of life we sought. 42. Absorbed in melancholy mood and o'er the granite coping bent, Onegin meditative stood, e'en as the poet says he lent. Tis silent all. Alone the cries of the night sentinels arise, And from the millionia afar the sudden rattling of a car. Lo, on the sleeping river born, A boat with splashing oar floats by, And now we hear delightedly a jolly song and distant horn. But sweeter in a midnight dream, Torquato's Tasso's strains I deem. 43. Ye billows of blue Hadrias see, O Brenta, once more we shall meet, And, inspiration firing me, Your magic voices I shall greet, Whose tones Apollo's sons inspire, And after Albion's proud lyre Possess my love and sympathy. The nights of golden Italy I'll pass beneath the firmament, Hid in the gondola's dark shade, Alone with my Venetian maid, now talkative, now reticent. From her my lips shall learn the tongue Of love which Wilhelm Petrarch sung. 44. When will my hour of freedom come? Time, I invoke thee. Favoring gales awaiting on the shore I roam And beckon to the passing sails. 
upon the highway of the sea when shall i wing my passage free on waves by tempests curdled o'er tis time to quit this weary shore so uncongenial to my mind to dream upon the sunny strand of africa ancestral land of dreary russia left behind wherein i felt love's fatal dart wherein i buried left my heart forty five eugene designed with me to start and visit many a foreign clime but fortune cast our lots apart for a protracted space of time just at that time his father died and soon oneguine's door beside of creditors a hungry rout their claims and explanations shout but eugene hating litigation and with his lot in life content to a surrender gave consent seeing in this no deprivation or counting on his uncle's death and what the old man might bequeath forty six and in reality one day the steward sent a note to tell how sick to death his uncle lay and wished him to say farewell having this mournful document perused eugene in post-chaise went and hastened to his uncle's side but in his heart dissatisfied having for money's sake alone sorrow to counterfeit and wail thus we began our little tale but to his uncle's mansion flown he found him on the table laid a due which must to earth be paid forty seven the courtyard full of serfs he sees, and from the country all around had come both friends and enemies. Funeral amateurs abound. The body they consigned to rest, and then made merry pope and guest, with serious air then went away as men who much had done that day. Lo, my Oneguin, rural lord, of mines and meadows, woods and lakes, he now a full possession takes. He, who economy abhorred, delighted much his former ways to vary for a few brief days. 48. For two whole days it seemed a change to wander through the meadows still, the cool dark oaken grove to range, to listen to the rippling rill. But on the third of grove and mead he took no more the slightest heed. They made him feel inclined to doze and the conviction soon arose, and we can in the country dwell, though without palaces and streets, cards, balls, routs, poetries, or fetes, on him spleen mounted sentinel, and like his shadow dogged his life, or better, like a faithful wife. 49. I was for calm existence made, for rural solitude and dreams, my lyre sings sweeter in the shade, and more imagination teems. On innocent delights I dote, upon my lake I love to float. For law I far nine to take, and every morning I awake the child of sloth and liberty. I slumber much, a little read, of fleeting glory take no heed. In former years thus did not I in idleness and tranquil joy the happiest days of life employ. 50. Love, flowers, the country, idleness, and fields my joys have ever been. I like the difference to express between myself and my Eugene, lest the malicious reader or some one or other editor of keen sarcastic intellect here in my portrait should detect, and impiously should declare to sketch myself that I have tried, like Byron, bard of scorn and pride, as if impossible it were to write of any other elf than one's own fascinating self. 51. Here I remark all poets are love to idealize inclined. I have dreamed many a vision fair, and the recesses of my mind retained the image, though short-lived, which afterwards the muse revived. Thus carelessly I once portrayed mine own ideal, the mountain maid, the captives of the Salgur shore. But now a question in this wise oft upon friendly lips doth rise. Whom doth thy plaintive muse adore? 
to whom amongst the jealous throng of maids dost thou inscribe thy song? 52. Whose glance reflecting inspiration with tenderness hath recognized thy meditative incantation? Whom hath thy strain immortalized? None. Be my witness heaven above. The malady of hopeless love I have endured without respite. Happy who thereto can unite poetic transport. They impart a double force unto their song, Who following Petrarch move along And ease the tortures of the heart. Perchance they laurels also cull. But I, in love, was mute and dull. 53. The muse appeared, when loved passed by, And my dark soul to light was brought. Free, I renewed the idolatry of harmony enshrining thought. I write, and anguish flies away, nor doth my absent pen portray around my stanzas incomplete young ladies' faces and their feet. Extinguished ashes do not blaze. I mourn, but tears I cannot shed. Soon, of the tempest which hath fled, time will the ravages efface. When that time comes, a poem I'll strive to write in Cantos 25. 54. I've thought well o'er the general plan, the hero's name, too, in advance. Meantime I'll finish, whilst I can, canto the first of this romance. I've scanned it with a jealous eye, discovered much absurdity, but will not modify a tittle. I owe the censorship a little. For journalistic declatitian, I yield the fruit of work severe. Go, on the Neva's bank appear, my very latest composition. Enjoy the mead which fame bestows, misunderstanding, words and blows. End of Canto the First Canto the Second The Poet 1. The village wherein yawned Eugene was a delightful little spot. There friends of pure delight had been grateful to heaven for their lot. The lonely mansion-house to screen from gales a hill behind was seen. Before it ran a stream. Behold, afar, where clothed in green and gold meadows and cornfields are displayed, Villages in the distance show, and herds of oxen wandering low, whilst near, sunk in deeper shade, a thick, immense, neglected grove extended, haunt which dryads love. 2. T'was built, the venerable pile, as lordly mansions ought to be, in solid, unpretentious style, the style of wise antiquity. Lofty the chambers, one and all, Silk tapestry upon the wall, Imperial portraits hang around, And stoves of various shapes abound. All this, I know, is out of date, I cannot tell the reason why, But Eugene, incontestably, The matter did not agitate, Because he yawned at the bare view Of drawing-rooms, or old or new. 3. He took the room wherein the old man, forty years long in this wise, his housekeeper was wont to scold, look through the window, and kill flies. T'was plain, as oaken floor ye scan, two cupboards, table, soft divan, and not a speck of dust descried. Onegin oped the cupboards wide. In one he doth accounts behold, here bottles stand in close array, there jars of cider block the way, An almanac but eight years old. His uncle, a busy man indeed, No other book had time to read. 4. Alone amid possessions great, Eugene at first began to dream, If but to lighten time's dull rate, Of many an economic scheme, this anchorite amid his waist the ancient boschina replaced by an obrick's indulgent rate the peasant blessed his happy fate but this a heinous crime appeared unto his neighbour 
a man of thrift, who secretly denounced the gift, and many another slyly sneered. And all with one accord agreed, he was a dangerous fool indeed. 5. All visited him at first, of course, but since to the back door they led most usually a Cossack horse upon the dawn's broad pastures bred, if they but heard domestic iodes come rumbling up the neighboring roads, most by this circumstance offended all overtures of friendship ended. Oh, what a fool our neighbor is! He's a Freemason, so we think. Alone he doth his claret drink, a lady's hand doth never kiss. Tis yes, no, never, madam, sir. This was his social character. 6. Into the district then to boot a new proprietor arrived, from whose analysis minute the neighborhood fresh sport derived. Vladimir Lensky was his name. From Goodingen inspired he came, a worshipper of Kant, a bard, a young and handsome galliard. He brought from mystic Germany the fruits of learning, and combined a fiery and eccentric mind, idolatry of liberty, a wild enthusiastic tongue, black curls which to his shoulders hung. 7. The pervert world with icy chill had not yet withered his young breast. His heart reciprocated still when friendship smiled, or love caressed. He was a dear, delightful fool, a nursling yet for hope to school. The riot of the world and glare still sovereigns of his spirit were, and by a sweet delusion he would soothe the doubtings of his soul. He deemed of human life the goal to be a charming mystery. He racked his brains to find its clue, and marvels deemed he thus should view. 8. This he believed, a kindred sprite impelled to union with his own lay languishing both day and night, waiting his coming, his alone. He deemed his friends, but longed to make great sacrifices for his sake, that a friend's arm in every case felled a calumniator base, that chosen heroes consecrate friends of the sons of every land, exist that their mortal band shall surely, be it soon or late, pour on this orb a dazzling light, and bless mankind with full delight. 9. Compassion now, or wrath inspires, and now philanthropy his soul, and now his youthful heart desires the path which leads to glory's goal. His heart beneath that sky had rung where sometimes Geta, Schiller, sung, and at the altar of their fame he kindled his poetic flame. But from the muse's loftiest height the gifted songster never swerved, but proudly in his song preserved an ever-transcendental flight. His transports were quite maidenly, charming with grave simplicity. 10. He sang of love, to love a slave, his ditties were as pure and bright as thoughts which gentle maidens have, as a babe's slumber, or the light of the moon in the tranquil skies, goddess of lovers' tender sighs. He sang of separation grim, of what not, and of distant dim, of roses to romancers dear. To foreign lands he would allude, where long time he in solitude had let fall many a bitter tear, he sang of life's fresh colors stained, before he eighteen years attained. 11. Since Eugene in that solitude gifts such as these alone could prize, a scant attendance Lenski showed at neighboring hospitalities. He shunned those parties boisterous, the conversation tedious about the crop of hay, the wine, the kennel, or a kindred line was certainly not erudite, nor sparked with poetic fire, nor wit, nor did the same inspire a sense of social delight, but still more stupid did appear the gossip of their ladies fair. 12. Handsome and rich, 
the neighborhood Lenski as a good match received. Such is the country custom good. All mothers their sweet girls believed suitable for this semi-Russian. He enters. Rapidly discussion shifts, tacks about, until they prate the sorrows of a single state. Perchance where Dunia pours out tea, the young proprietor we find. To Dunia then they whisper, Bind. And a guitar produced we see, And heavens, warbled forth we hear, Come to my golden palace, dear. 13. But Lenski, having no desire, Vows matrimonial to break, With our Onegin doth aspire Acquaintance instantly to make. They meet. Earth, water, prose and verse, or ice and flame, are not diverse, if they were similar in aught. At first such contradictions wrought mutual repulsion and ennui, but grown familiar side by side on horseback every day they ride. Inseparable soon they be. Thus oft, this I myself confess, men become friends from idleness. 14. But even thus, not nowadays, in spite of common sense, we're wont as ciphers others to appraise, ourselves as unities to count. And like Napoleon's, each of us a million bipeds reckons thus one instrument for his own use. Feeling is silly, dangerous. Eugene, more tolerant than this, though certainly mankind he knew, and usually despised it, too. Exceptionless as no rule is, a few of different temper deemed, feeling in others much esteemed. 15. With smiling face he Lenski hears, the poet's fervid conversation and judgment, which unsteady veers an eye which gleams with inspiration, all this was novel to Eugene. The cold reply with gloomy mien he oft upon his lips would curb, thinking, "'Tis foolish to disturb this evanescent boyish bliss. Time without me will lessons give. So meantime let him joyous live and deem the world perfection is. Forgive the fever youth inspires, and youthful madness youthful fires.'" 16. The gulf between them was so vast, debate commanded ample food. The laws of generations passed, the fruits of science, evil, good, the prejudices all men have, the fatal secrets of the grave, and life and fate in turn selected were to analysis subjected. The fervid poet would recite, carried away by ecstasy, Fragments of northern poetry, whilst Eugene, condescending quite, though scarcely following what was said, attentive listened to the lad. 17. But more the passions occupy the converse of our hermits twain, and, heaving a regretful sigh, an exile from their tribulous reign, Eugene would speak regarding these. Thrice happy who their agonies hath suffered but indifferent groan, Still happier he who ne'er hath known. By absence who hath chilled his love, His hate by slander, and who spends existence without wife or friends, Whom jealous transport cannot move, And who the rent-roll of his race ne'er trusted to the treacherous ace. 18. When Wise at length, we seek repose beneath the flag of quietude, when passion's fire no longer glows and when her violence reviewed, each gust of temper, silly word, seems so unnatural and absurd. Reduced with effort unto sense, we hear with interest intense the accents wild of others' woes. They stir the heart as heretofore. So ancient warriors, battles o'er, a curious interest disclose in yarns of youthful troopers gay, lost in the hamlet far away. 
19. And in addition, youth is flame and cannot anything conceal, is ever ready to proclaim the love, hate, sorrow, joy we feel. Deeming himself a veteran scarred in love's campaigns, Onegin heard with quite a lachrymose expression the youthful poet's fond confession. He with an innocence extreme his inner consciousness laid bare, and Eugene soon discovered there the story of his young love's dream, where plentifully feelings flow which we experienced long ago. 20. Alas! He loved as in our times men love no more, as only the mad spirit of the man who rhymes is still condemned in love to be. One image occupied his mind, constant affection intertwined and an habitual sense of pain, and distance interposed in vain, nor years of separation all, nor homage which the muse demands, nor beauties of far distant lands, nor study, banquet, rout, nor ball, his constant soul could ever tire, which glowed with virginal desire. 21. But when a boy he Olga loved, unknown as yet the aching heart, he witnessed tenderly and moved her girlish gaiety and sport. Beneath the sheltering oak tree's shade he with his little maiden played, whilst the fond parents, friends through life, dreamed in the future man and wife. And full of innocent delight, as in a thicket's humble shade, beneath her parents' eyes the maid grew like a lily, pure and white, unseen in thick and tangled grass by bee and butterfly which pass. 22. Twas she who first within his breast poetic transport did infuse, and thoughts of Olga first impressed a mournful temper on his muse. Farewell, thou golden days of love. T'was then he loved the tangled grove and solitude and calm delight, the moon, the stars, and shining night, the moon, the lamp of heaven above, to whom we used to consecrate a promenade in the twilight late with tears which secret sufferers love. But now, in her effulgence pale, a substitute for lamps we hail. 23. Obedient she had ever been, and modest, cheerful as the morn, as a poetic life serene, sweet as the kiss of lovers sworn. Her eyes were of cerulean blue, her locks were of a golden hue, her movements, voice and figure slight. All about Olga, to a light romance of love I pray refer, you'll find her portrait there, I vouch. I formerly admired her much, but finally grew bored by her. But with her elder sister, I must now my stanzas occupy. 24. Tatiana was her appellation. We are the first who such a name in pages of a love narration with such perversity proclaim. But wherefore not? Tis pleasant, nice, euphonious, though I know a spice it carries of antiquity and of the attic. Honestly, we must admit but little taste doth in us our names appear. I speak not of our poems here. An education runs to waste endowing us from out her store with affectation, nothing more. 25. And so Tatiana was her name. Nor by her sister's brilliancy, nor by her beauty, she became the cynosure of every eye. Shy, silent did the maid appear, as in the timid forest dear. Even beneath her parents' roof stood as estranged from all aloof. Nearest and dearest knew not how to fawn upon and love express. A child devoid of childishness, to romp and play she ne'er would go, oft staring through the window-pane would she in silence long remain. 26. Contemplativeness, her delight, e'en from her cradle's earliest dream, 
adorned with many a vision bright of rural life the sluggish stream ne'er touched her fingers indolent the needle nor o'er framework bent would she the canvas tight enrich with gay design and silken stitch desire to rule ye may observe when the obedient doll in sport an infant maiden doth exhort polite demeanour to preserve gravely repeating to another recent instructions of its mother twenty seven but tanya ne'er displayed a passion for dolls e'en from her earliest years and gossip of the town and fashion she ne'er repeated unto hers strange unto her each childish game but when the winter season came and dark and drear the evenings were terrible tales she loved to hear and when for olga nurse arrayed in the broad meadow a gay rout all the young people round about at prisoner's base she never played their noisy laugh her soul annoyed their giddy sports she ne'er enjoyed twenty eight she loved upon the balcony to anticipate the break of day when on the pallid eastern sky the starry beacons fade away the horizon luminous doth grow morning's forerunners breezes blow and gradually the day unfolds in winter when night longer holds a hemisphere beneath her sway longer in the east inert reclines beneath the moon which dimly shines and calmly sleeps the hours away at the same hour she oped her eyes and would by candlelight arise twenty nine romances pleased her from the first her all in all did constitute in love adventures she was first rousseau and richardson to boot not a bad fellow was her father though superannuated rather in books he saw not to condemn but as he never opened them viewed them with not a little scorn and gave himself but little pain his daughter's books to ascertain which neath her pillow lay till morn his wife was also mad upon the works of mr richardson thirty she was thus fond of richardson not that she had his works perused or that adoring grandison that rascal lovelace she abused but that princess pauline of old her moscow cousin often told the tale of these romantic men her husband was a bridegroom then and she despite herself would waste sighs on another than her lord whose qualities appeared to afford more satisfaction to her taste her grandison was in the guard a noted fop who gambled hard thirty one like his her dress was always nice the height of fashion fitting tight but contrary to her advice the girl in marriage they unite then her distraction to allay the bridegroom sage without delay removed her to his country seat where god alone knows whom she met she struggled hard at first thus pent nigh separated from her spouse then became busy with the house first reconciled and then content habit was given us in distress by heaven in lieu of happiness thirty two habit alleviates the grief inseparable from our lot this great discovery relief and consolation soon begot and then she soon twixt work and leisure found out the secret how at pleasure to dominate her worthy lord and harmony was soon restored the workpeople she superintended mushrooms for winter salted down kept the accounts shaved many a crown the bath on saturdays attended when angry beat her maids i grieve and all without her husband's leave thirty three in her friend's albums time had been with blood instead of ink she scrawled baptized proscovia pauline and in her conversation drawled she wore her corset tightly bound the russian n with nasal sound she would pronounce a la francais but soon she altered all her ways corset and album and pauline her sentimental verses all she soon forgot 
began to call Akolka, who was once Selene, and had with wadding in the end her caps and nightdresses to mend. 34. As for her spouse, he loved her dearly, in her affairs ne'er interfered, entrusted all to her sincerely, in dressing-gown at meals appeared. Existence calmly sped along, and oft at eventide a throng of friends unceremonious would assemble from the old neighborhood. They growl a bit, they scandalize, they crack a feeble joke and smile. Thus the time passes, and, meanwhile, Olga the tea must supervise. Tis time for supper, now for bed, and soon the friendly troop hath fled. 35. They in a peaceful life preserved customs by ages sanctified. Strictly the carnival observed, ate Russian pancakes at Shrovetide, twice in the year to fast were bound, of whirligigs were very fond, of Christmas carols, song and dance. When people with long countenance on Trinity Sunday yawned at prayer, three tears they dropped with humble mien upon a bunch of lovage green, Vast needful was to them as air. On guests their servants used to wait, By rank as settled by the state. 36. Thus age approached, the common doom, And death before the husband wide Opened the portals of the tomb, And a new diadem supplied. Just before dinner-time he slept, By neighboring families bewept, by children and by faithful wife with deeper woe than others grief he was an honest gentleman and where at last his bones repose the epithet on the marble shows demetrius lorine sinful man servant of god and brigadier enjoyeth peaceful slumber here thirty seven to his penates now returned Vladimir Lensky visited his neighbor's lowly tomb and mourned above the ashes of the dead. There long time sad at heart he stayed. Poor Yorick, mournfully he said, how often in thine arms I lay, how with thy medal I would play, the medal Ochakov conferred. To me he would his Olga give, would whisper, shall I so long live? and by a genuine sorrow stirred, Lenski his pencil-case took out, and an elegiac poem wrote. 36. Likewise an epitaph with tears he writes upon his parents' tomb, and thus ancestral dust reveres. Oh, on the fields of life how bloom harvests of souls unceasingly by providence's dark decree! They blossom, ripen, and they fall, and others rise, ephemeral. Thus our light race grows up and lives, a moment effervescing stirs, then seeks ancestral sepulchres. The appointed hour arrives, arrives, and our successors soon shall drive us from the world wherein we live. 39. Meantime, Drink deeply of the flow of frivolous existence, friends. Its insignificance I know and care but little for its ends. To dreams I long have closed mine eyes, yet sometimes banished hopes will rise and agitate my heart again. And thus it is t'would cause me pain without the faintest trace to leave this world. I do not praise desire yet still apparently aspire my mournful fate in verse to weave, that like a friendly voice its tone rescue me from oblivion. 40. Perchance some heart twill agitate, and then the stanzas of my theme will not, preserved by kindly fate, perish absorbed by Lethe's stream. Then it may be, O oh flattering tale, some future ignoramus shall my famous portrait indicate and cry, He was a poet great. My gratitude do not disdain, admirer of the peaceful muse, 
whose memory doth not refuse my light productions to retain, whose hands indulgently caress the bays of age and helplessness. End of Canto the Second Canto the Third, The Country Damsel One. Whither away? Deuce take the bard! Goodbye, Onegin, I must go. I won't detain you, but tis hard to guess how you the eve pull through. At Larna's. Hm, that is queer. Pray, is it not a tough affair, thus to assassinate the eve? Not at all. That I can't conceive. Tis something of this sort, I deem. In the first place, say, am I right? A Russian household, simple, quite, who welcome guests with zeal extreme, preserves, and an eternal prattle about the rain, and flax, and cattle. 2. No misery I see in that. Boredom, my friend, behold the ill. Your fashionable world I hate. Domestic life attracts me still. Where, what, another ecologue spin? For God's sake, Lenski, don't begin. What, really going? Tis too bad. But Lenski, I should be so glad, would you me this Phyllis show? Fair source of every fine idea, verses and tears, etc. Present me. You are joking. No. Delighted. When? This very night. They will receive us with delight. 3. Whilst homeward by the nearest route our heroes at full gallop sped, can we not stealthily make out what they in conversation said? How now, Onegin, yawning still? Tis habit, Lenski. Is your ill more troublesome than usual? No. How dark the night is getting, though. Hello. Andrushka, onward race. The drive becomes monotonous. Well, Lorena appears to us an ancient lady full of grace. That bilberry wine, I'm sore afraid, the deuce with my inside has played. 4. Say, of the two, which was Tatiana? She who with melancholy face and silent as the maid Svetlana, hard by the window, took her place. The younger. You're in love with her. Well, I the elder should prefer, were I like you, a bard by trade, in Olga's face no life's displayed. Tis a Madonna of Van Dyke, an oval countenance and pink, yon silly moon upon the brink of the horizon she is like. Vladimir something curtly said, nor further comment that night made. 5. Meantime. Onegin's apparition at Larna's abode produced quite a sensation, the position to all good neighbors' sport conduced. Endless conjectures all propound, and secretly their views expound. What jokes and guesses now abound! A bow is for Tatiana found. In fact, some people were assured the wedding day had been arranged, but the date subsequently changed till proper rings could be procured. On Lenski's matrimonial fate, they long ago had held debate. 6. Of course, Tatiana was annoyed by such allusions scandalous, yet was her inmost soul o'erjoyed with satisfaction marvellous, as in her heart the thought sank home. I am in love, my hour hath come. Thus in the earth the seed expands obedient to warm spring's commands. Long time her young imagination by indolence and languor fired the fated nutriment desired. And long internal agitation had filled her youthful breast with gloom. She waited for I don't know whom. 
7. The fateful hour had come at last. She oped her eyes and cried, "'Tis he! Alas! For now before her passed the same warm vision constantly. Now all things round about repeat ceaselessly to the maiden sweet his name. The tenderness of home tiresome unto her hath become, and the kind-hearted servitors. Immersed in melancholy thought, she hears of conversation not and hated casual visitors. Their coming which no man expects, and stay whose length none recollects. 8. Now with what eager interest she the delicious novel reads, with what avidity and zest she drinks in those seductive deeds. All the creations which below from happy inspiration flow, the swain of Julia Walmar, Malik Adele, and Delinar, Werther, rebellious martyr bold, and that unrivaled paragon, the sleep-compelling Grandison, our tender dreamer had enrolled a single being, t'was in fine no other than Onegin mine. 9. Dreaming herself the heroine of the romances she preferred, Clarissa, Julia, Delphine, Tatiana through the forest aired, and the bad book accompanies. Upon those pages she describes her passion's faithful counterpart, fruit of the yearnings of the heart. She heaves a sigh, and deep intent on raptures, sorrows not her own. She murmurs in an undertone a letter for her hero meant. That hero, though his merit shone, was certainly no grandison. 10. Alas! My friends, the years flit by, and after them at headlong pace, the evanescent fashions fly in motley and amusing chase. The world is ever altering. Farthingales, patches, were the thing, and courtier, fop, and usurer would once in powdered wig appear. Time was, the poet's tender quill in hopes of everlasting fame a finished madrigal would frame, or couplets more ingenious still. Time was, a valiant general might serve who could neither read nor write. 11. Time was, in style, magniloquent authors replete with sacred fire their heroes used to represent all that perfection could desire. Ever by adverse fate oppressed, their idols they were wont to invest with intellect, a taste refined, and handsome countenance combined a heart where impure passion burnt, the excited hero in a trice was ready for self-sacrifice, and in the final tome we learnt, vice had due punishment awarded, virtue was with a bride rewarded. 12. But now our minds are mystified and virtue acts as a narcotic, vice in romance is glorified and triumphs in career erotic. The monsters of the British muse deprive our schoolgirls of repose. The idols of their adoration, a vampire, fond of meditation. Or Melmoth, gloomy wanderer he, the eternal Jew, or the corsair, or the mysterious Sobger. Byron's capricious fantasy could in romantic mantle drape e'en hopeless egoism's dark shape. 13. My friends, what means this odd digression? May be that I, by heaven's decrees, Shall abdicate the bard's profession, And shall adopt some new caprice. Thus having braved Apollo's rage With humble prose, I'll fill my page, And a romance, in ancient style, Shall my declining years beguile. Nor shall my pen paint terribly The torment born of crime unseen, But shall depict the touching scene Of Russian domesticity, I will descant on love's sweet dream. The olden time shall be my theme. 14. Old people's simple conversations my unpretending page shall fill. Their offspring's innocent flirtations by the old lime tree or the rill. Their jealousy and separation and tears of reconciliation. Fresh cause of quarrel then I'll find but finally in wedlock bind. 
the passionate speeches i'll repeat accents of rapture or despair i uttered to my lady fair long ago prostrate at her feet then they came easily enow my tongue is somewhat rusty now fifteen tatiana sweet tatiana see what bitter tears with thee i shed thou hast resigned thy destiny unto a ruthless tyrant dread thou'lt suffer dearest but before hope with her fascinating power to dire contentment shall give birth and thou shalt taste the joys of earth thou'lt quaff love's sweet and venomed stream fantastic images shall swarm in thy imagination warm of happy meetings thou shalt dream and wheresoe'er thy footsteps err confront thy fated torturer sixteen love's pangs tatiana agonize she seeks the garden in her need suddenly she stops casts down her eyes and cares not farther to proceed her bosom heaves whilst crimson hues with sudden flash her cheeks suffuse barely to draw her breath she seems her eye with fire unwanted gleams and now tis night the guardian moon sails her allotted course on high and from the misty woodland nigh the nightingale trills forth her tune restless tatiana sleepless lay and thus under her nurse did say seventeen nurse tis so close i cannot rest open the window sit by me what ails thee dear i feel depressed relate some ancient history but which my dear in days of yore within my memory i bore many an ancient legend which in monsters and fair dames was rich but now my mind is desolate what once i knew is clean forgot alas how wretched now my lot but tell me nurse can you relate the days which to your youth belong were you in love when you were young eighteen alack tatiana she replied we never loved in days of old my mother-in-law who lately died had killed me had the like been told how come you then to wed a man why as god ordered my ivan was younger than myself my light for i myself was thirteen quite the matchmaker a fortnight's bed her suit before my parents pressing at last my father gave his blessing in bitter tears of fright i shed Weeping they loosed my tresses long, And led me off to church with song. 19. Then amongst strangers I was left, But I perceive thou dost not heed. Alas, dear nurse, my heart is cleft, Mortally sick I am indeed. Behold, my sobs I scarce restrain. My darling child, thou art in pain the lord deliver her and save tell me at once what wilt thou have i'll sprinkle thee with holy water how thy hands burn dear nurse i'm well i am in love you know don't tell the lord be with thee o my daughter and the old nurse a brief prayer said and crossed with trembling hand the maid Twenty. i am in love her whispers tell the aged woman in her woe my heart's delight thou art not well i am in love nurse leave me now behold the moon was shining bright and showed with an uncertain light tatiana's beauty pale with care her tears and her dishevelled hair and on the footstool sitting down beside our youthful heroine fair a kerchief round her silver hair the aged nurse in ample gown whilst all creation seemed to dream enchanted by the moon's pale beam twenty one but born in spirit far away tatiana gazes on the moon 
and starting suddenly doth say, Nurse, leave me, I would be alone. Pen, paper bring, the table too draw near. I soon to sleep shall go. Good night. Behold, she is alone. Tis silent. On her shines the moon. Upon her elbow she reclines. And Eugene, ever in her soul, indites an inconsiderate scroll, wherein love innocently pines. Now it is ready to be sent. For whom, Tatiana, is it meant? 22. I have known beauties cold and raw as winter in their purity, striking the intellect with awe by dull insensibility, and I admired their common sense and natural benevolence, but, I acknowledge, from them fled. For on their brows I trembling read the inscription o'er the gates of hell, Abandon hope for ever here. Love to inspire doth woe appear to such, delightful to repel. Perchance upon the Neva e'en similar dames you may have seen. 23. Amid submissive herds of men virgins miraculous I see, who selfishly unmoved remain alike by sighs and flattery. But what astonished do I find when harsher demeanour hath consigned a timid love to banishment, on fresh allurements they are bent, at least by show of sympathy. At least their accents and their words appear attuned to softer chords, and then with blind credulity the youthful lover once again pursues phantasmagoria vain. 24. Why is Tatiana guiltier deemed? Because in singleness of thought she never of deception dreamed, but trusted the ideal she wrought? Because her passion wanted art, obeyed the impulses of heart? Because she was so innocent that heaven her character had blent with an imagination wild, with intellect and strong volition, and a determined disposition, an ardent heart, and yet so mild? Doth love's incautiousness in her so irremissible appear? 25. O ye whom tender love hath pained with the ken of parents both, whose hearts responsive have remained to the impressions of our youth, the all-entrancing joys of love, young ladies, if ye ever strove the mystic lines to tear away a lover's letter might convey, or into bold hands anxiously have e'er a precious tress consigned, or even, silent and resigned, when separation's hour drew nigh, have felt love's agitated kiss with tears, confused emotions, bliss. 26. With unanimity complete, condemn not weak Tatiana mine. Do not cold-bloodedly repeat the sneers of critics superfine. And you, O maids immaculate, whom vice, if named, doth agitate e'en as the presence of a snake, I the same admonition make. Who knows, with love's consuming flame perchance you also soon may burn, then to some gallant in your turn will be ascribed by treacherous fame the triumph of a conquest new. The god of love is after you. 27. A coquette loves by calculation. Tatiana's love was quite sincere. A love which knew no limitation, even as the love of children dear. She did not think procrastination enhances love and estimation and thus secures the prey we seek his vanity first let us pique with hope and then perplexity excruciate the heart and late with jealous fire resuscitate lest jaded with satiety the artful prisoner should seek incessantly his chains to break twenty eight i still a complication view 
my country's honour and repute demands that i translate for you the letter which tatiana wrote at russ she was by no means clever and read our newspapers scarce ever and in her native language she possessed nor ease nor fluency so she in french herself expressed i cannot help it i declare though hitherto a lady ne'er in russ her love made manifest and never hath our language proud in correspondence been allowed. 29. They wish that ladies should, I hear, learn Russian. But the Lord defend! I can't conceive a little dear with the well-wisher in her hand. I ask, all ye who poets are, is it not true? The object's fair, to whom ye for unnumbered crimes had to compose in secret rhymes, to whom your hearts were consecrate, did they not all the Russian tongue with little knowledge and that wrong in charming fashion mutilate? Did not their lips with foreign speech the native Russian tongue impeach? 30. God grant I meet not at a ball or on a promenade, mayhap, a schoolmaster in yellow shawl or a professor in tulle cap as rosy lips without a smile the russian language i deem vile without grammatical mistakes may be and this my terror wakes the fair of the next generation as every journal now entreats will teach grammatical conceits introduce verse in conversation but i what is all this to me will to the old times faithful be. 31. Speech careless, incorrect, but soft, with inexact pronunciation raises within my breast as oft as formerly much agitation. Repentance wields now not her spell, and galakisms I love as well as the sins of my youthful days, or Bogdanovich's sweet lays. But I must now employ my muse with the epistle of my fair. I promised. Did I so? Well, there. Now I am ready to refuse. I know that Parney's tender pen is no more cherished amongst men. 32. Bard of the feasts, a mournful breast, if thou wert sitting by my side, with this immoderate request I should alarm our friendship tried. In one of thine enchanting lays to russify the foreign phrase of my impassioned heroine. Where art thou? Come, pretensions mine I yield with a low reverence. But lonely beneath Finnish skies, where melancholy rocks arise, he wanders in his indolence. Careless of fame his spirit high, hears not my importunity. 33. Tatiana's letter I possess, I guard it as a holy thing, and though I read it with distress, I am o'er it ever pondering. Inspired by whom this tenderness, this gentle daring who could guess? Who this soft nonsense could impart, imprudent prattle of the heart, attractive in its banefulness? I cannot understand, but lo, a feeble version read below a print without a picture's grace, or, as it were, the Freischultz's score strummed by a timid schoolgirl, or... Tatiana's Letter to Anegen I write you. Is more required? Can lower depths beyond remain? Tis in your power now, if desired, to crush me with a just disdain. But if my lot unfortunate you in the least commiserate, you will not all abandon me. At first I clung to secrecy. Believe me, of my present shame you never would have heard the name. If the fond hope I could have fanned at times, if only once a week, to see you by our fireside stand, to listen to the words you speak, to address to you one single phrase, and then to meditate for days of one thing till again we met. Tis said you are misanthrope, in country solitude you mope, and we, an unattractive set, can hearty welcome give alone. 
why did you visit our poor place forgotten in the village lone i never should have seen your face and bitter torment never known the untutored spirit's pangs calmed down by time who can anticipate i had found my predestinate become a faithful wife and e'en a fond and careful mother been another to none other i my heart's allegiance can resign my doom has been pronounced on high tis heaven's will and i am thine the sum of my existence gone but promise of our meeting gave i feel thou wast by god sent down my guardian angel to the grave thou didst to me in dreams appear unseen thou wast already dear thine eyes subdued me with strange glance i heard thy voices resonance long ago dream it cannot be scarce hadst thou entered thee i knew i flushed up stupefied i grew and cried within myself it is he is it not truth in tones suppressed with thee i conversed when i bore comfort and succor to the poor and when i prayer to heaven addressed to ease the anguish of my breast nay even as this instant fled was it not thou o vision bright that glimmered through the radiant night and gently hovered over my head was it not thou who thus did stoop to whisper comfort love and hope who art thou guardian angel sent or torturer malevolent doubt and uncertainty decide all this may be an empty dream delusions of a mind untried providence otherwise may deem then be it so my destiny from henceforth i confide to thee lo at thy feet my tears i pour and thy protection i implore imagine here alone am i no one my anguish comprehends at times my reason almost bends and silently here i must die but i await thee scarce alive my heart with but one look revive or to disturb my dream's approach alas with merited reproach tis finished horrible to read with shame i shudder and with dread but boldly i myself resign thine honour is my countersign thirty four tatiana moans and now she sighs and in her grasp the letter shakes even the rosy wafer dries upon her tongue which fever breaks her head upon the breast declines and an enchanting shoulder shines from her half-open vest of night but lo already the moon's light is waning yonder valley deep looms gray behind the mist and morn silvers the brook the shepherd's horn arouses rustics from their sleep tis day the family downstairs but not for this tatiana cares thirty five the break of day she doth not see but sits in bed with air depressed nor on the letter yet hath she the image of her seal impressed but grey philippevna the door opened with care and entering bore a cup of tea upon a tray tis time my child arise i pray my beauty thou art ready too my morning birdie yesternight i was half silly with affright but praised be god in health art thou the pains of night have wholly fled thy cheek is as a poppy red thirty six ah nurse a favour do for me command me darling what you choose do not you might suspicious be but look you ah do not refuse i call to witness god on high then send your grandson quietly to take this letter to o well unto our neighbour mind you tell command him not to say a word i mean my name not to repeat to whom is it to go my sweet of late i have been quite absurd so many neighbours here exist am i to go through the whole list thirty seven how dull you are this morning nurse 
my darling growing old am i in age the memory gets worse but i was sharp in times gone by in times gone by thy bare command oh nurse nurse you don't understand what is thy cleverness to me the letter is the thing you see oneguine's letter ah the thing now don't be cross with me my soul you know that i am now a fool but why are your cheeks whitening nothing good nurse there's nothing wrong but send your grandson before long thirty eight no answer all that day was born another passed twas just the same pale as a ghost and dressed since morn tatiana waits no answer came olga's admirer came that day tell me why doth your comrade stay the hostess doth interrogate he hath neglected us of late tatiana blushed her heart beat quick he promised here this day to ride lenski unto the dame replied the post hath kept him it is like shamefaced tatiana downward looked as if he cruelly had joked thirty nine twas dusk upon the table bright shrill sang the samovar at eve the china teapot too ye might in clouds of steam above perceive into the cups already sped by olga's hand distributed the fragrant tea in darkling stream and a boy handed round the cream tanya doth by the casement linger and breathes upon the chilly glass dreaming of what not pretty lass and traces with a slender finger upon its damp opacity the mystic monogram o e forty in the meantime her spirit sinks her weary eyes are filled with tears a horse's hoofs she hears she shrinks near they come eugene appears ah then a spectre from the dead more swift the room tatiana fled from hall to yard and garden flies not daring to cast back her eyes she fears and like an arrow rushes through park and meadow wood and brake the bridge and alley to the lake bramble she snaps and lilacs crushes the flower beds skirts the brook doth meet till out of breath upon a seat forty one she sank he's here eugene is here merciful god what will he deem yet still her heart which torments tear guards fondly hope's uncertain dream she waits on fire her trembling frame will he pursue but no one came she heard of servant maids the note who in the orchards gathered fruit singing in chorus all the while this by command for it was found however cherries might abound they disappeared by stealth and guile so mouths they stopped with song not fruit device of rural minds acute the maiden's song young maidens fair maidens friends and companions disport yourselves maidens arouse yourselves fair ones come sing we in chorus the secrets of maidens allure the young gallant with dance and with song as we lure the young gallant espy him approaching disperse yourselves darlings and pelt him with cherries with cherries red currants with raspberries cherries approach not to hearken to secrets of virgins approach not to gaze at the frolics of maidens forty two they sang whilst negligently seated attentive to the echoing sound tatiana with impatience waited until her heart less high should bound till the fire in her cheek decreased but tremor still her frame possessed nor did her blushes fade away more crimson every moment they thus shines the wretched butterfly with iridescent wing doth flap when captured in a schoolboy's cap thus shakes the hare when suddenly she from the winter corn espies a sportsman who in covert lies forty three 
but finally she heaves a sigh, and rising from her bench proceeds. But scarce had turned the corner nigh, which to the neighboring alley leads, when Eugene like a ghost did rise before her straight with roguish eyes. Tatiana faltered, and became scarlet as burnt by inward flame. But this adventure's consequence to-day, my friends, at any rate, I am not strong enough to state. I, after so much eloquence, must take a walk and rest a bit. Some day I'll somehow finish it. End of Canto the Third Canto the Fourth Rural Life One. The less we love a lady fair, the easier it is to gain her grace, and the more surely we ensnare her in the pitfalls which we place. Time was when cold seduction strove to swagger as the art of love, everywhere trumpeting its feats, not seeking love, but sensual sweets. But this amusement delicate was worthy of that old baboon our fathers used to dote upon. The lovelaces are out of date. Their glory, with their heels of red and their long perukes, hath vanished. 2. For who in posture can endure a constant harping on one tune, serious endeavors to assure what everybody long has known? Ever to hear the same replies and overcome antipathies which never have existed, even in little maidens of thirteen? And what like menaces fatigues, Entreaties, oaths, fictitious fear, epistles of six sheets or near, rings, tears, deceptions and intrigues, aunts, mothers and their scrutiny, and husbands' tedious amity. 3. Such were the musings of Eugene. He in the early years of life had a deluded victim been of air and of the passion's strife by daily life deteriorated, a while this beauty captivated, and that no longer could inspire. Slowly exhausted by desire, yet satiated with success, in solitude or worldly din, he heard his soul's complaint within, with laughter smothered weariness, and thus he spent eight years of time, destroyed the blossom of his prime. 4. Though beauty no more he adored, he still made love in a queer way. Rebuffed, as quickly reassured, jilted, glad of a holiday. Without enthusiasm he met the fair, nor parted with regret, scarce mindful of their love and guile. Thus a guest with composure will to take a hand at whist off come. He takes his seat, concludes his game, and straight returning whence he came, tranquilly goes to sleep at home, and in the morning doth not know whither that evening he will go. 5. However, Tanya's letter reading, Eugene was touched with sympathy. The language of her girlish pleading aroused in him sweet reverie. He called to mind Tatiana's grace, pallid and melancholy face, and in a vision, sinless, bright, his spirit sank with strange delight. May be the empire of the sense regained authority a while, but he desired not to beguile such open-hearted innocence, but to the garden once again wherein we lately left the twain. 6. Two minutes they in silence spent. Onegin then approached and said, You have a letter to me sent. Do not excuse yourself. I read confessions which a trusting heart may well in innocence impart. Charming is your sincerity. Feelings which long had ceased to be it wakens in my breast again. But I came not to adulate. Your frankness I shall compensate by an avowal just as plain. An ear to my confession lend. To thy decree my will I bend. 7. If the domestic hearth could bless, my sum of happiness contained, if wife and children to possess a happy destiny ordained, 
If in the scenes of home I might e'en for an instant find a light, then, I say truly, none but thee I would desire my bride to be. I say without poetic phrase, found the ideal of my youth. Thee only would I choose, in truth, as partner of my mournful days. Thee only pledge of all things bright, and be as happy as I might. 8. But strange am I to happiness, tis foreign to my cast of thought. Me your perfections would not bless, I am not worthy them in aught. And honestly, tis my belief our union would produce but grief. Though now my love might be intense, habit would bring indifference. I see you weep. These tears of yours tend not my heart to mitigate, but merely to exasperate. Judge, then, what roses would be ours, what pleasures Hymen would prepare for us, maybe for a year. 9. What can be drearier than the house, wherein the miserable wife deplores a most unworthy spouse and leads a solitary life? The tiresome man, her value knowing, yet curses on his fate bestowing, is full of frigid jealousy, mute, solemn, frowning gloomily. Such am I. This did ye expect, when in simplicity ye wrote your innocent and charming note with so much warmth and intellect? Hath fate apportioned unto thee this lot in life with stern decree? 10. Ideas and time ne'er backward move. My soul I cannot renovate. I love you with a brother's love, perchance one more affectionate. Listen to me without disdain. A mate hath oft, may yet again replace the visions fancy drew. Thus trees in spring their leaves renew, as in their turn the seasons roll. Tis evidently heaven's will, you fall in love again. But still, learn to possess more self-control. Not all will like myself proceed, and thoughtlessness to woe might lead. 11. Thus did our friend Onegin preach. Tatiana, dim with tears in her eyes, attentive listened to his speech, all breathless and without replies. His arm he offers. Mute and sad, mechanically, let us add, Tatiana doth accept his aid, and, hanging down her head, the maid around the garden homeward hies. Together they returned, nor word of censure for the same incurred. The country hath its liberties and privileges nice allowed, even as Moscow, city proud. 12. Confess, O ye who this peruse, Onegin acted very well by poor Tatiana in the blues. T'was not the first time, I can tell you, he a noble mind disclosed. Though some men, evilly disposed, spared him not their asperities. His friends, and also enemies, one in the same thing it may be, esteemed him much as the world goes. Yes, every one must have his foes, but, Lord, from friends deliver me. The deuce take friends, my friends, amends I've had to make for having friends. 13. But how? Quite so. Though I dismiss dark, unavailing reverie, I just hint, in parenthesis, there's no stupid calumny born of a blabber in a loft and by the world repeated oft. There's no fish-market retort and no ridiculous report which your true friend with a sweet smile where fashionable circles meet a hundred times will not repeat, quite inadvertently, meanwhile. And yet he in your cause would strive and loves you as a relative. 14. Hem, hem, my reader noble, are all your relatives quite well? Permit me, it is worth the trouble for your instruction here to tell what I by relatives conceive, these are your relatives, believe, those whom we ought to love, caress, with spiritual tenderness, 
whom, as the custom is of men, we visit about Christmas Day, or by a card our homage pay, that until Christmas comes again they may forget that we exist. And so, God bless them, if he list. 15. In this the love of the fair sex beats that of friends and relatives. In love, although its tempests vex, our liberty at least survives. Agreed. But then the whirl of fashion, the natural fickleness of passion, the torrent of opinion, and the fair sex as light as down. Besides the hobbies of a spouse should be respected throughout life by ever proper-minded wife, and this the faithful one allows, when in an instant she is lost. Satan will jest, and at love's cost. 16. Oh, where bestow our love? Whom trust? Where is he who doth not deceive? Who words and actions will adjust to standards in which we believe? Oh, who is not calumnious? Who labors hard to humor us? To whom are our misfortunes grief, and who is not a tiresome thief? My venerated reader, oh, cease the pursuit of shadows vain. Spare yourself unavailing pain, and all your love on self bestow. A worthy object tis, and well I know there's none more amiable. 17. But from the interview, what flowed? Alas, it is not hard to guess. The insensate fire of love still glowed, nor discontinued to distress a spirit which for sorrow yearned. Tatiana more than ever burned with hopeless passion. From her bed sweet slumber winged its way and fled. Her health, life's sweetness and its bloom, her smile and maidenly repose, all vanished as an echo goes. Across her youth a shade had come, as when the tempest's veil is drawn across the smiling face of dawn. 18. Alas, Tatiana fades away, grows pale and sinks, but nothing says. Listless is she the live-long day, nor interest in aught betrays. Shaking with serious air the head, in whispers low the neighbors said, "'Tis time she to the altar went!' but enough. Now, tis my intent the imagination to enliven with love which happiness extends. Against my inclination, friends, by sympathy I have been driven. Forgive me. Such the love I bear my heroine, Tatiana dear. 19. Vladimir, hourly more a slave to youthful Olga's beauty bright, into delicious bondage gave his ardent soul with full delight. Always together, eventide found them in darkness side by side. At morn, hand clasped in hand, they rove around the meadow in the grove. And what resulted? Drunk with love, but with confused and bashful air, Lenski at intervals would dare, if Olga smilingly approve, dally with a disheveled tress or kiss the border of her dress. 20. To Olga frequently he would some nice instructive novel read, whose author nature understood better than Chateaubriand did. Yet sometimes pages two or three, nonsense and pure absurdity, for maiden's hearing deemed unfit, he somewhat blushing would omit. Far from the rest the pair would creep and, elbows on the table, they a game of chess would often play buried in meditation deep, till absently Vladimir took, with his own pawn, alas, his rook. 21. Homeward returning, he at home is occupied with Olga Fair, an album, a fly-leaf of the tome, he leisurely adorns for her. Landscapes thereon he would design, a tombstone, Aphrodite's shrine, or with a pen and colors fit, a dove on which a lyre doth sit. The in memoriam pages sought, where many another hand had signed a tender couplet he combined, a register of fleeting thought, 
a flimsy trace of musings past which might for many ages last. 22. Surely ye all have overhauled a country damsel's album trim, which all her darling friends have scrawled from first to last page to the rim. Behold, orthography despising, meterless verses recognizing by friendship how they were abused, hewn, hacked, and otherwise ill-used. Upon the opening page you find, Que rirez-vous sous sur ces tablettes? Subscribed, Toujours à vous, Annette. And on the last one, underlined, Who in thy love finds more delight, Beyond this may attempt to write. 23. Infallibly there you will find Two hearts, a torch, of flowers a wreath, And vows will probably be signed, affectionately yours till death. Some army poet therein may have smuggled his flagitious lay. In such an album with delight I would, my friends, inscriptions write, because I should be sure, meanwhile, my verses, kindly meant, would earn delighted glances in return, that afterwards with evil smile they would not solemnly debate if cleverly or not I prate. 24. But, O oh, ye tomes without compare, which from the devil's bookcase start? Albums magnificent which scare the fashionable rhymester's heart. Yea, although rendered beauteous by Tolstoy's pencil marvellous, though Bertinsky verses penned, the thunderbolt on you descend. Whene'er a brilliant courtly dame presents her quarto amiably, despair and anger seize on me, and malicious epigram trembles upon my lips from spite, and madrigals I'm asked to write. 25. But Lenski's madrigals never wrote, in Olga's album, youthful maid, to purest love he tuned his note, nor frigid adulation paid. What never was remarked or heard of Olga he in song averred. His elegies, which plenteous streamed, both natural and truthful seemed. Thus thou, Yezikov, doth arise in armorous flights when so inspired, singing God knows what maid admired, and all thy precious elegies, some time collected, shall relate the story of a life and fate. 26. Since fame and freedom he adored, incited by his stormy muse, Odes Lenski also had outpoured, but Olga would not such peruse. When poets lacrimose recite beneath the eyes of ladies bright their own productions, some insist no greater pleasure can exist. Just so, that modest swain is blessed who reads his visionary theme to the fair object of his dream, a beauty languidly at rest. Yes, happy, though she at his side by other thoughts be occupied. 27. But I the products of my muse, consisting of harmonious lays, to my old nurse alone peruse, companion of my childhood days. Or, after dinner's dull repast, I by the buttonhole seize fast my neighbor, who by chance drew near, and breathe a drama in his ear. Or else, I deal not here in jokes, Exhausted by my woes and rhymes, I sail upon my lake at times, and terrify a swarm of ducks, who, heard the music of my lay, take to their wings and fly away. 28. But to Onegin, apropos, friends, I must your indulgence pray. His daily occupations, lo, minutely I will now portray. A hermit's life Onegin led. At seven in summer he rose from bed, and clad in airy costume took his course unto the running brook. There, aping Gulnar's bard, he spanned his hellespont from bank to bank, and then a cup of coffee drank, some wretched journal in his hand, then dressed himself. 29. Sound asleep, books, walking were his bliss, the murmuring brook, the woodland shade, the uncontaminated kiss of a dark-eyed country maid, a fiery yet well-broken horse, a dinner 
whimsical each course, a bottle of a vintage white and solitude and calm delight. Such was Oneguine's sainted life, and such unconsciously he led, nor marked how summer's prime had fled in aimless ease and far from strife, the curse of commonplace delight and town and friends forgotten quite. 30. This northern summer of our own, on winters of the south a skit, glimmers and dies. This is well known, though we will not acknowledge it. Already autumn chilled the sky. The tiny sun shone less on high, and shorter had the days become. The forests in mysterious gloom were stripped with melancholy sound. Upon the earth a mist did lie, and many a caravan on high of clamorous geese flew southward bound. A weary season was at hand. November at the gate did stand. 31. The morn arises foggy, cold. The silent fields no peasant nears. The wolf upon the highways bold with his ferocious mate appears. Detecting him the passing horse snorts, and his rider bends his course, and wisely gallops to the hill. No more at dawn the shepherd will drive out the cattle from their shed, nor at the hour of noon with the sound of horn in circle call them round. Singing inside her hut, the maiden spins, whilst the friend of wintry night, the pine torch, by her crackles bright. 32. Already crisp hoar-frosts impose o'er all a sheet of silvery dust. Readers expect the rhyme of rose, there, take it quickly if ye must. Behold, then polished floor more nice, the shining river clothed in ice, a joyous troop of little boys engraved the ice with strident noise. A heavy goose on scarlet feet, thinking to float upon the stream, descends the bank with care extreme, but staggers, slips, and falls. We greet the first bright wreathing storm of snow which falls in starry flakes below. 33. How in the country pass this time? Walking? The landscape tires the eye in winter by its blank and dim and naked uniformity. On horseback, gallop over the steppe, your steed, though rough-shod, cannot keep his footing on the treacherous rhyme, and may fall headlong any time. Alone beneath your roof-tree stay, and read De Pratt or Walter Scott. Keep your accounts. You'd rather not? Then get mad, drunk, or wroth. The day will pass. The same to-morrow try. You'll spend your winter famously. 34. A true child Herod, my Eugene, to idle musings was a prey. At morn an icy bath within he sat, then the live-long day, alone within his habitation and buried deep in meditation. He round the billiard-table stalked, the balls impelled, the blunt cue chalked. When evening o'er the landscape looms, billiards abandoned, cue forgot, a table to the fire is brought, and he waits dinner. Alensky comes, driving abreast three horses gray. Bring dinner now, without delay. 35. Upon the table in a trice of widow Clicquot or Moet a blessed bottle, placed on ice. For the young poet they display. Like Hipposerene, it scatters light, its ebullition foaming white, like other things I could relate, my heart of old would captivate. The last poor obol I was worth, Was it not so? For thee I gave, And thy inebriating wave Full many a foolish prank brought forth. And oh, what verses, what delights, Delicious visions, jests and fights! 36. Alas, my stomach it betrays With its exhilarating flow. And I confess that nowadays I prefer sensible Bordeaux. To cope with I no more I dare, For I is like a mistress fair, Seductive, animated, bright, But willful, frivolous, and light. 
But thou, Bordeaux, art like the friend who in the agony of grief is ever ready with relief. Assistance ever will extend, or quietly partake our woe. All hail, my good old friend Bordeaux. 37. The fire sinks low. An ashy cloak the golden ember now enshrines, and barely visible the smoke upward in a thin stream inclines. But little warmth the fireplace lends. Tobacco smoke the flue ascends. The goblet still is bubbling bright. Outside descend the mists of night. How pleasantly the evening jogs, when o'er a glass with friends we prate just at the hour we designate the time between the wolf and dogs. I cannot tell on what pretense. But lo, the friends to chat commence. 38. How are our neighbors fair, pray tell? Tatiana, saucy Olga thine. The family are all quite well. Give me just a half a glass of wine. They send their compliments. But, oh, how charming Olga's shoulders grow. Her figure perfect grows with time. She is an angel. We sometime must visit them. Come, you must own, my friend, tis but to pay a debt. For twice you came to them, and yet you never since your nose have shown. But stay. Am dolt am I who speak. They have invited you this week. 39. Me? Yes, it is Tatiana's fete next Saturday. The Lorena told me to ask you. Ere that date, make up your mind to go there. Ah, it will be by a mob beset, of every sort and every set. Not in the least, assured am I. Who will be there? The family. Do me a favor and appear, will you? Agreed. I thank you, friend. And saying this, Vladimir drained his cup unto his maiden dear. Then touching Olga they depart in fresh discourse. Such, love, thou art. 40. He was most gay. The happy date in three weeks would arrive for them. The secrets of the marriage state and love's delicious diadem with rapturous longing he awaits. Nor in his dreams anticipates Hymen's embarrassments, distress, and freezing fits of weariness. Though we, of Hymen's foes, meanwhile, in life domestic see a string of pictures painful harrowing, a novel in La Fontaine's style, my wretched Lenski's fate I mourned, he seemed for matrimony born. 41. He was beloved, or say at least, he thought so, and existence charmed. The credulous indeed are blessed, and he who, jealously disarmed, in sensual sweets his soul doth steep as drunken tramps at nightfall sleep, or, parable more flattering, as butterflies to blossoms cling. But wretched who anticipates, whose brain no fond illusions daze, who every gesture, every phrase in true interpretation hates, whose heart experience icy made and yet oblivion forbade. End of Canto the Fourth Canto the Fifth The Fete One, that year the autumn season late kept lingering on as loath to go. All nature winter seemed to await, till January fell no snow, the third at night. Tatiana wakes betimes, and sees, when morning breaks, park, garden, palings, yard below, and roofs near morn blanched o'er with snow. Upon the window's tracery, the trees in silvery array, down in the courtyard magpies gay, and the far mountains daintily o'erspread with winter's carpet bright, all so distinct, and all so white. 2. Winter. The peasant blithely goes to labor in his sledge forgot. His pony sniffing the fresh snows just manages a feeble trot, though deep he sinks into the drift. Forth the kibitka gallops swift, 
its driver seated on the rim in scarlet sash and sheepskin trim. Yonder the household lad doth run, placed in a sledge his terrier black, himself transformed into a hack, to freeze his finger hath begun. He laughs, although it aches from cold. His mother from the door doth scold. 3. In scenes like these it may be, though, ye feel but little interest. They are all natural, and, lo, are not with elegance impressed. Another bard with art divine hath pictured in his gorgeous line the first appearance of the snows and all the joys which winter knows. He will delight you, I am sure, when he in ardent verse portrays secret excursions made in sleighs. But competition I abjure, either with him or thee in song. Bard of the finish, maiden young. 4. Tatiana, Russian to the core, herself not knowing well the reason, the Russian winter did adore, and the cold beauties of the season. On sunny days the glistening rime, sledging, the snows, which at the time of sunset glow with rosy light, the misty evenings ere twelfth night. These evenings, as in days of old, the Larnas would celebrate, the servants used to congregate, and the young ladies' fortunes told, and every year distributed journeys and warriors to wed. 5. Tatiana, in traditions old believed, the people's wisdom weird, in dreams and what the moon foretold, and what she from the cards inferred, omens inspired her soul with fear. Mysteriously, all objects near a hidden meeting could impart, presentiments oppressed her heart. Lo, the prim cat upon the stove with one paw strokes her face and purrs. Tatiana certainly infers that guests approach, and when above the new moon's crescent slim she spied, suddenly to the left-hand side. 6. She trembled and grew deadly pale, or swift a meteor, may be, across the gloom of heavens would sail and disappear in space, and then she would haste in agitation dire to mutter her concealed desire ere the bright messenger had sent when in her walks abroad she met a friar black approaching near, or a swift hare from mead to mead had run across her path at speed, wholly beside herself with fear, anticipating woe, she pined, certain misfortune near opined. 7. Wherefore? She found a secret joy in horror for itself alone. Thus nature doth our souls alloy, thus her perversity hath shown. A twelfth night approaches. Merry eves, when thoughtless youth whom nothing grieves, before whose inexperienced sight life lies extended, vast and bright, to peer into the future tries. Old age through spectacles too peers, although the destined coffin nears. Having lost all in life we prize, it matters not. Hope e'en to these with childlike lisp will lie to please. 8. Tatiana gazed with curious eye on melted wax in water poured. The clue unto some mystery she deemed its outline might afford. Rings from a dish of water full in order do the maidens pull. But when Tatiana's hand had ta'en a ring, she heard the ancient strain. The peasants there are rich as kings. They shovel silver with a spade. He whom we sing to shall be made happy and glorious. But this brings with sad refrain misfortune near. Girls the Kashorka much prefer. 9. Frosty the night, the heavens shone. The wondrous host of heavenly spheres sailed silently in unison. Tatiana in the yard appears in a half-open dressing-gown and bends her mirror on the moon. 
but trembling on the mirror dark the sad moon only could remark list the snow crunches he draws nigh the girl on tiptoe forward bounds and her voice sweeter than the sounds of clarinet or flute doth cry what is your name the boar looked dazed and agathon replied amazed ten tatiana the nurse the project planned by night prepared for sorcery and in the bathroom did command to lay two covers secretly but sudden fear assailed tatiana and i remembering svetlana became alarmed so never mind i'm not for witchcraft now inclined so she her silken sash unlaced undressed herself and went to bed and soon lel hovered over her head beneath her downy pillow placed a little virgin mirror peeps to silent all tatiana sleeps eleven a dreadful sleep tatiana sleeps she dreamt she journeyed o'er a field all covered up with snow in heaps by melancholy fogs concealed amid the snowdrifts which surround a stream by winter's ice unbound impetuously clove its way with boiling torrent dark and gray two poles together glued by ice a fragile bridge and insecure spanned the unbridled torrent o'er beside the thundering abyss tatiana in despair unfeigned rooted unto the spot remained twelve as if against obstruction sore tatiana o'er the stream complained to help her to the other shore no one appeared to lend a hand but suddenly a snowdrift stirs and what from its recess appears a bristly bear of monstrous size he roars and ah tatiana cries he offers her his murderous paw she nerves herself from her alarm and leans upon the monster's arm with footsteps tremulous with awe passes the torrent but alack bruin is marching at her back thirteen she to turn back her eyes afraid accelerates her hasty pace but cannot anyhow evade her shaggy myrmidon in chase the bear rolls on with many a grunt a forest now she sees in front with fir trees standing motionless in melancholy loveliness their branches by the snow bowed down through aspens limes and birches bare the shining orbs of night appear there is no path the storm hath strewn both bush and brake, ravine and steep, and all in snow is buried deep. 14. The wood she enters, bare behind, in snow she sinks up to the knee. Now a long branch itself entwined around her neck, now violently away her golden earrings tore, now the sweet little shoes she wore grown clammy stick fast in the snow her handkerchief she loses now no time to pick it up afraid she hears the bear behind her press nor dares the skirting of her dress for shame lift up the modest maid she runs the bear upon her trail until her powers of running fail fifteen she sank upon the snow but bruin adroitly seized and carried her submissive as if in a swoon she cannot draw a breath or stir he dragged her by a forest road till amid trees a hovel showed by barren snow heaped up and bound a tangled wilderness around bright blazed the window of the place with resounded shriek and shout my chum lives here bruin grunts out warm yourself here a little space straight for the entrance then he made and her upon the threshold laid sixteen recovering tanya gazes round 
there gone, she at the threshold placed. Inside clink glasses, cries resound as if it were some funeral feast. But dreaming all this nonsense pure, she peeped through a chink of the door. What does she see? Around the board sit many monstrous shapes abhorred. A canine face with horns thereon, another with a cock's head appeared. Here an old witch with herset beard, there an imperious skeleton. A dwarf adorned with tail, again a shape half cat and half a crane. 17. Yet ghastlier, yet more wonderful, a crab upon a spider rides, perched on a goose's neck a skull in scarlet cap revolving glides. A windmill, too, a jig performs, and wildly waves its arms and storms. Barking, songs, whistling, laughter coarse, the speech of man and tramp of horse. But wide Tatiana oped her eyes, when in that company she saw him who inspired both love and awe, the hero we immortalize. Onegin sat the table by and viewed the door with cunning eye. 18. All bustle when he makes a sign. He drinks, all drink and loudly call. He smiles, in laughter all combine. He knits his brows, tis silent all. He there is master, that is plain. Tatiana courage doth regain, and grown more curious by far, just placed the entrance door ajar. The wind rose instantly, blew out the fire of the nocturnal lights, a trouble fell upon the sprites. Onegin lightning glances shot, furious he from the table rose, all arise, to the door he goes. 19. Terror assails her. Hastily Tatiana would attempt to fly. She cannot. Then impatiently she strains her throat to force a cry. She cannot. Eugene oped the door, and the young girl appeared before those hellish phantoms. Peals arise of frantic laughter, and all eyes and hoofs and crooked snouts and paws tails which a bushy tuft adorns, whiskers and bloody tongues and horns, sharp rows of tushes, bony claws, are turned upon her. All combine in one great shout. She's mine! She's mine! 20. Mine! cried Eugene with savage tone. The troop of apparitions fled and in the frosty night alone remained with him the youthful maid. With tranquil air Onegin leads Tatiana to a corner, bids her on a shaky bench sit down. His head sinks slowly, rests upon her shoulder. Olga swiftly came, and Lenski followed. A light broke. His fist Onegin fiercely shook and gazed around with eyes of flame. The unbidden guests he roughly chides. Tatiana motionless abides. 21. The strife grew furious, and Eugene grasped a long knife and instantly struck Lenski dead. Across the scene dark shadows thicken. A dread cry was uttered, and the cabin shook. Tatiana, terrified, awoke. She gazed around her. It was day. Lo, through the frozen windows play Aurora's ruddy rays of light. The door flew open. Olga came, more blooming than the boreal flame and swifter than the swallow's flight. Come, she cried, sister, tell me e'en whom you in slumber may have seen. 22. But she... Her sister never heeding, with book in hand reclined in bed, page after page continued reading, but no reply under her maid. 
Although her book did not contain the bard's enthusiastic strain, nor precepts sage, nor pictures e'en, yet neither Virgil nor Racine, nor Byron, Walter Scott, nor Seneca, nor the Journal de Mode, I vouch, ever absorbed a maiden so much. Its name, my friends, was Martin Zadika, the chief of the Chaldeans wise, who dreams expound and prophesies. 23. Brought by a peddler vagabond unto their solitude one day, this monument of thought profound Tatiana purchased with a stray tome of Malvina, and but three and a half roubles down gave she. Also, to equalize the scales, she got a book of nursery tales, a grammar, likewise portrayed too, Marmontel also, tome the third. Tatiana every day conferred with Martin Zadeka. In woe she consolation thence obtained, inseparable they remained. 24. The dream left terror in its train. Not knowing its interpretation, Tanya the meaning would obtain of such a dread hallucination. Tatiana to the index flies and alphabetically tries the words bear, bridge, fur, darkness, bog, raven, snowstorm, tempest, fog, etc. But nothing showed her Martin Zadeka in aid. Though the foul vision promise made of a most mournful episode, and many a day thereafter laid a load of care upon the maid. 25. But lo, forth from the valleys dun with purple hand Aurora leads, swift following in her wake the sun, and a grand festival proceeds. The Lorinas were since sunrise o'erwhelmed with guests. By families the neighbors came, in sledge approach. Britska, Kabitka, or in a coach. Crush and confusion in the hall. Latest arrivals, salutations. Barking, young ladies' oscillations. Shouts, laughter, jamming against the wall. Bows and the scrape of many feet. Nurses who scream and babes who bleat. 26. Bringing his partner, corpulent, Fat Pustyakov drove to the door. Kvazdine, a landlord excellent, Oppressor of the wretched poor. And the Skatenines, aged pair, With all their progeny were there, Who from two years to thirty tell, Patushkov, the provincial swell, Boyanov, too, my cousin, Wore his wadded coat and cap with peak, Surely you know him as I speak. And Flayanov, pensioned counsellor, Rogue and extortioner of yore, Now buffoon, glutton, and a bore. 27. The family of Karlikov came with Monsieur Truquet, a prig, Who arrived lately from Tamboff, In spectacles and chestnut wig. Like a true Frenchman, couplets wrought in Tanya's praise in pouch he brought, known unto children perfectly, Revelez-vous, belle endomie. Among some ancient ballads thrust, he found them in an almanac, and the sagacious Droquet back to light had brought them from their dust, whilst he, belle Nina, had the face by belle Tatiana to replace. 28. Lo, from the nearest barrack came of old maids the divinity, and comfort of each country dame, the captain of a company. He enters. Ah, good news to-day. The military band will play. The colonel sent it. Oh, delight! So there will be a dance to-night. Girls in anticipation skip. But dinner-time comes. Two and two they hand in hand to table go. The maids beside Tatiana keep, men opposite. The cross they sign, and chattering loud sit down to dine. 29. 
ceased for a space all chattering. Jaws are at work. On every side plates, knives, and forks are clattering, and ringing wine-glasses are plied. But by degrees the crowd begin to raise a clamour and a din. They laugh, they argue, and they brawl, they shout, and no one lists at all. The doors swing open. Lenski makes his entrance with Onegin. Ah, at last the author, cries Mama. The guests make room. Aside each takes his chair, plate, knife, and fork in haste. The friends are called and quickly placed. 30. Right opposite Tatiana placed, she, then the morning moon more pale, more timid than a doe long chased, lifts not her eyes which swimming fail. Anew the flames of passion start within her, she is sick at heart. The two friends' compliments she hears not, and with a flood of bitter tears with effort she restrains. Well nigh the poor girl fell into a faint, but strength of mind and self-restraint prevailed at last. She in reply said something in an undertone, and at the table sat her down. 31. To Tragedy the fainting fit, and female tears hysterical. Onegin could not now submit, for long he had endured them all. Our misanthrope was full of ire, at a great feast against desire, and marking Tanya's agitation, cast down his eyes in trepidation and sulked in silent indignation. Swearing how Lenski he would rile, avenge himself in proper style. Triumph by Anticipation Caricatures he now designed of all the guests within his mind. 32. Certainly not Eugene alone Tatiana's trouble might have spied, but that the eyes of every one by a rich pie were occupied. Unhappily too salt by far, and that a bottle sealed with tar appeared, Don's effervescing boast, between the blanc mange and the roast. Behind, of glasses and array, tall, slender, like thy form designed, Zizi, thou mirror of my mind, fair object of my guileless lay, seductive cup of love, whose flow made me so tipsy long ago. 33. From the moist cork the bottle freed with loud explosion, the bright wine hissed forth, with serious air indeed, long tortured by his lay divine, Tricot arose, and for the bard the company deep silence guard. Tanya well nigh expired when he turned to her and discordantly intoned it, manuscript in hand. Voices and hands applaud, and she must bow in common courtesy. The poet, modest though so grand, drank to her health in the first place, then handed her the song with grace. 34. Congratulations. Toasts resound. Tatiana thanks to all returned. But, when Onegin's turn came round, the maiden's weary eye which yearned, her agitation and distress aroused in him some tenderness. He bowed to her, nor silence broke, but somehow there shone in his look the witching light of sympathy. I know not if his heart felt pain, or if he meant to flirt again, from habit or maliciously, but kindness from his eye had beamed, and to revive Tatiana seemed. 35. The chairs are thrust back with a roar, the crowd unto the drawing-room speeds, as bees who leave their dainty store and seek in buzzing swarms the meads. Contented, and with victuals stored, Neighbor by neighbor sat and snored. Matrons unto the fireplace go. Maids in the corner whisper low. Behold, green tables are brought forth, and testy gamesters do engage in Boston and the game of age. Ombre, and whilst all others worth, a strong resemblance these possess, all sons of mental weariness. 36. Eight rubbers were already played, eight times the heroes of the fight change of position had essayed, when tea was brought. Tis my delight time to denote by dinner, tea, and supper. 
In the country we can count the time without much fuss. The stomach doth admonish us. And, by the way, I here assert that for that matter in my verse as many dinners I rehearse, as oft to meet and drink avert, as thou, great Homer, didst of yore, whom thirty centuries adore. 37. I will with thy divinity contend with knife and fork and platter, but grant with magnanimity I'm beaten in another matter. Thy heroes, sanguinary rites, also thy rough and tumble fights, thy Venus and thy Jupiter, more advantageously appear than cold Onegin's oddities, the aspect of a landscape drear. Or in Istomina, my dear, and fashion's gay frivolities, but my Tatiana, on my soul, is sweeter than thy Helen foul. 38. No one the contrary will urge, though for his Helen Menelaus again a sentry should scourge us, and like Trojan warriors slay us, though around honoured Priam's throne Troy's sages should in concert own once more, when she appeared in sight, Paris and Menelaus right. But as to fighting, twill appear. For patience, reader, I must plead, a little farther please to read, and be not in advance severe. There'll be a fight, I do not lie, my word of honour given have I. 39. The tea, as I remarked, appeared, but scarce had maids their saucers tin, when in the grand salon was heard of bassoons and of flutes the strain. His soul by crash of music fired, his tea with rum no more desired, the Paris of those country parts to Olga Petoshkova darts, to Tanya Lensky, Kerlikova, a marriageable maid matured, the poet from Tambov secured. Buyanov whist off Paustiakova. All to the grand saloon are gone, the ball in all its splendor shone. 40. I tried, when I began this tale, see the first canto, if ye will, a ball in Peter's capital, to sketch ye in Albano style. But by fantastic dreams distraught, my memory wandered wide and sought the feet of my dear lady friends. O oh, feet, where your path extends, I long enough deceived have erred. The perfidies I recollect should make me much more circumspect. Reform me both in deed and word, and this fifth canto ought to be from such digressions wholly free. 41. The whirlwind of the waltz sweeps by, undeviating and insane as giddy use hilarity. Pair after pair the race sustain. The moment for revenge, meanwhile, espying, Eugene with a smile approaches Olga and the pair amid the company career. Soon the maiden on a chair he seats, begins to talk of this and that, but when two minutes she had sat, again the giddy waltz repeats. All are amazed, but Lenski, he scarce credits what his eyes can see. 42. Hark! The mazurka! In times past, when the mazurka used to peal, all rattled into the ballroom vast, the parquet cracked beneath the heel, and jolting jarred the window frames. Tis not so now. Like gentle dames we glide along a floor of wax. However, the mazurka lacks naught of its charms original in country towns, where still it keeps its stamping, capers, and high leaps. Fashion is there immutable. Who tyrannizes us with ease? Of modern Russians the disease. 43. Boyanov, wrathful cousin mine, Unto the hero of this lay Olga and Tanya led. Malign, Onegin Olga bore away. Gliding in negligent career, He bending whispered in her ear Some madrigal not worth a rush, And pressed her hand. The crimson blush upon her cheek by adulation grew brighter still. But Lenski hath seen all, beside himself with wrath, and hot with jealous indignation, 
till the mazurka's close he stays her hand for the cotillion prays forty four she fears she cannot cannot why she promised eugene or she would with great delight o oh god on high heard he the truth and thus she could and can it be but late a child and now a fickle flirt and wild cunning already to display and well instructed to betray lenski the stroke could not sustain at womankind he growled a curse departed ordered out his horse and galloped home but pistols twain a pair of bullets not beside his fate shall presently decide End of Canto the Fifth Canto the Sixth The Duel One Having remarked Vladimir's flight, Onegin, bored to death again, by Olga stood, dejected quite and satisfied with vengeance tain. Olga began to long likewise for Lenski, sought him with her eyes, and endless the cotillion seemed, as if some troubled dream she dreamed. Tis done. To supper they proceed. Bedding is laid out, and to all assigned a lodging, from the hall up to the attic, and all need tranquil repose. Eugene alone, to pass the night at home, hath gone. 2. All slumber. In the drawing-room, loud snores the cumbrous Prustyakov, with better half as cumbersome, Gvazdine, Boyanov, Patushkov, and Flyanov, somewhat indisposed, on chairs in the saloon reposed, whilst on the floor Monsieur Troquet, in jersey and in nightcap lay. In Olga's and Tatiana's rooms lay all the girls by sleep embraced, except one by the window placed, whom pale Diana's ray illumes, my poor Tatiana cannot sleep, but stares into the darkness deep. 3. His visit she had not awaited, his momentary loving glance her inmost soul had penetrated, and his strange conduct at the dance with Olga. Nor of this appeared an explanation. She was scared, alarmed by jealous agonies. A hand of ice appeared to seize her heart, it seemed a darksome pit beneath her roaring open wide. I shall expire, Tatiana cried, but death from him will be delight. I murmur not. Why mournfulness? He cannot give me happiness. 4. Haste, haste thy lagging pace, my story. A new acquaintance we must scan. There dwells five verse from Krasnogory, Vladimir's property, a man who thrives this moment as I write, a philosophic anchorite, Zarestki, once a bully bold, a gambling troop when he controlled, chief rascal, pothouse president, now of a family the head, simple and kindly and unwed, true friend, landlord benevolent, yea, and a man of honor, lo, how perfect doth our epoch grow. 5. Time was the flattering voice of fame, his ruffian bravery adored, and true, his pistol's faultless aim and ace at fifteen paces bored. But I must add to what I write that, tipsy once in actual fight, he from his Kalmuk horse did leap in mud and mire to wallow deep, drunk as a fly. And thus the French a valuable hostage gained, a modern Regulus unchained, who to surrender did not blench, that every morn at various cost three flasks of wine he might exhaust. 6. Time was, his raillery was gay, he loved the simpleton to mock, to make wise men the idiot play openly or neath a decent cloak. Yet sometimes this or that deceit encountered punishment complete, and sometimes into snares as well himself like a greenhorn fell, he could in disputation shine with pungent or obtuse retort, at times to silence would resort, at times talk nonsense with design. Quarrels among young friends he bred, and to the field of honor led. 7. Or reconciled them, it may be, and all the three to breakfast went, 
Then he'd malign them secretly with jest and gossip gaily blent, said Alia Tempora. And bravery, like love, another sort of knavery, diminishes as years decline. But, as I said, Zaretsky mine beneath acacias, cherry trees, from storms protections having sought, lived as a really wise man ought. Like Horace, planted cabbages, both ducks and geese in plenty bred, and lessons to his children read. 8. He was no fool, and Eugene mine, to friendship making no pretense, admired his judgment, which was fine, pervaded with much common sense. He usually was glad to see the man and liked his company, so, when he came next day to call, was not surprised thereby at all. But, after mutual compliments, Zaretsky with a knowing grin, ere conversation could begin, the epistle from the bard presents. Onegin to the window went, and scanned in silence its content. 9. It was a cheery, generous cartel, or a challenge to a fight, whereto in language courteous Lenski his comrade did invite. Onegin, by first impulse moved, turn and replied as it behooved, curtly announcing for the fray that he was ready any day. Zaretsky rose, nor would explain, he cared no longer there to stay, had much to do at home that day, and so departed. But Eugene, the matter by his conscience tried, was with himself dissatisfied. 10. In fact, the subject analyzed, within the secret court discussed, in much his conduct stigmatized. For, from the outset, t'was unjust to jest as he had done last eve, a timid, shrinking love to grieve. And ought he not to disregard the poet's madness? For tis hard at eighteen not to play the fool. Sincerely loving him, Eugene assuredly should not have been conventionality's dull tool, not a mere hot, pugnacious boy, but a man of sense and probity. 11. He might his motives have narrated, nor bristled up like a wild beast. He ought to have conciliated that youthful heart. But now at least the opportunity has flown. Besides, a duelist well known hath mixed himself in the affair. Malicious and a slanderer. Undoubtedly, disdain alone should recompense his idle jeers. But fools, their calumnies and sneers. Behold! The world's opinion, our idol, honor's motive force, round which revolves the universe. 12. Impatient, boiling o'er with wrath, the bard his answer waits at home. But lo, his braggart neighbor hath triumphant with the answer come. Now for the jealous youth what joy! He feared the criminal might try to treat the matter as a jest use subterfuge, and thus his breast from the dread pistol turn away. But now all doubt was set aside. Unto the windmill he must ride to-morrow before break of day, to cock the pistol, barrel bend on thigh or temple, friend on friend. 13. Resolved the flirt to cast away, the foaming Lenski would refuse, to see Olga ere the fray. His watch, the sun in turn he views, finally tossed his arms in air, and, lo, he is already there. He deemed his coming would inspire Olga with trepidation dire. He was deceived. Just as before, the miserable bard to meet, as hope uncertain and as sweet, Olga ran skipping from the door. She was as heedless and as gay, well, just as she was yesterday. 14. Why did you leave last night so soon? was the first question Olga made. Lenski, into confusion thrown, all silently hung down his head. Jealousy and vexation took to flight before her radiant look, before such fond simplicity and mental elasticity. He eyed her with a fond concern, perceived that he was still beloved, already by repentance moved to ask forgiveness seemed to yearn, but trembles, words he could not find, delighted, almost sane in mind. 15. 
but once more pensive and distressed beside his Olga doth he grieve, nor enough strength of mind possessed to mention the foregoing eve. He mused, I will her saviour be, with ardent sighs and flattery the vile seducer shall not dare the freshness of her heart impair, nor shall the caterpillar come the lily's stem to eat away, nor shall the bud of yesterday perish when half disclosed its bloom. All this, my friends, translate aright. I with my friend intend to fight. 16. If he had only known the wound which rankled in Tatiana's breast, and if Tatiana mine had found, if the poor maiden could have guessed that the two friends with morning's light above the yawning grave would fight, ah, it may be, affection true had reconciled the pair anew. But of this love, in casually, as yet none had discovered aught. Eugene, of course, related not. Tatiana suffered secretly. Her nurse, who could have made a guess, was famous for thick-headedness. 17. Lenski that even thought immersed, now gloomy seemed, and cheerful now. But he who by the muse was nursed is ever thus. With frowning brow to the pianoforte he moves, and various chords upon it proves. Then, eyeing Olga, whispers low, I am happy. Say, is it not so? But it grew late. He must not stay. Heavy his heart with anguish grew. To the young girl he said adieu, as it were, tore himself away. Gazing into his face, she said, What ails thee? Nothing. He is fled. 18. At home arriving, he addressed his care unto his pistol's plight, replaced them in their box, undressed and shiller read by candlelight. But one thought only filled his mind. His mournful heart no peace could find. Olga he sees before his eyes miraculously fair arise. Vladimir closes up his book and grasps a pen. His verse, albeit with lovers rubbish filled, was neat and flowed harmoniously. He took and spouted it with lyric fine, like D when dinner doth inspire. 19. Destiny hath preserved his lay. I have it. Lo, the very thing. Oh, whither have ye winged your way, ye golden days of my young spring? What will the coming dawn reveal? In vain my anxious eyes appeal. In mist profound all yet is hid. So be it. Just the laws which bid the fatal bullet penetrate, or innocently past me fly. Good governs all. The hour draws nigh of life or death predestinate. Blessed be the labors of the light, and blessed the shadows of the night. 20. Tomorrow's dawn will glimmer gray, bright day will then begin to burn, but the dark sepulchre I may have entered never to return. The memory of the bard, a dream, will be absorbed by Lethe's stream. Men will forget me, but my urn to visit, lovely maid, return, or my remains to drop a tear, and think, here lies who loved me well, for consecrate to me he fell in the dawn of existence drear. Maid whom my heart desires alone, approach, approach, I am thine own. 21. Thus in a style obscure and stale he wrote, "'Tis the romantic style, though of romance therein I fail to see aught, never mind meanwhile. And about dawn upon his breast his weary head declined at rest. For o'er a word to fashion known, ideal, he had drowsy grown. But scarce had sleep's soft witchery subdued him, when his neighbor stepped into the chamber where he slept, and wakened him with a loud cry, "'Tis time to get up. Seven doth strike. Onegin waits on us, tis like. 22. He was in error, for Eugene was sleeping then asleep like death. The pall of night was growing thin. To Lucifer the cock must breathe his song, when still he slumbered deep. The sun had mounted high his steep. A passing snowstorm wreathed away with pallid light, 
but Eugene lay upon his couch insensibly. Slumber still o'er him lingering flies. But finally he oped his eyes and turned aside the drapery. He gazed upon the clock which showed he long should have been on the road. 23. He rings in haste. In haste arrives his Frenchman, good Monsieur Guillot, who dressing gown and slippers gives and linen on him doth bestow. Dressing as quickly as he can, Eugene directs the trusty man to accompany him and to escort a box of terrible import. Harnessed the rapid sledge arrived. He enters, to the mill he drives, descends, the order of Guillot gives, the fatal tubes Lepage contrived to bring behind, the triple steeds, the two young oaks, the coachman leads. 24. Lenski, the foreman's apparition, leaning against the dam, expects. Zaretsky, village mechanician, in the meantime the mill inspects. Onegin, his excuses, say. But, cried Zaretsky in amaze, your second you have left behind. A duelist of classic mind, method was dear unto his heart. He would not that a man ye slay in a lax or informal way, but followed the strict rules of art and ancient usages observed, for which our praise he hath deserved. 25. My second, cried in turn Eugene, behold, my friend, Monsieur Gallot, to this arrangement can be seen no obstacle of which I know. Although unknown to fame, mayhap, he's a straightforward little chap. Zaretsky bit his lip in wrath, but to Vladimir Eugene saith, Shall we commence? Let it be so, Lenski replied, and soon they be behind the mill. Meantime ye see Zaretsky and Monsieur Gallot in consultation stand aside, the foes with downcast eyes abide. 26. Foes. Is it long since friendship rent asunder was and hate prepared? Since leisure was together spent, meals, secrets, occupations shared? Now... Like hereditary foes, malignant fury they disclose, as in some frenzied dream of fear these friends cold-bloodedly draw near mutual destruction to contrive. Cannot they amicably smile ere crimson stains their hands defile? Depart in peace and friendly live? But fashionable hatred's flame trembles at artificial shame. 27. The shining pistols are uncased, the mallet loud the ramrod stakes. Bullets are down the barrels pressed. For the first time the hammer clicks. Lo, poured in a thin gray cascade, the powder in the pan is laid. The sharp flint, screwed securely on, is cocked once more. Uneasy groan, Galo behind a pollard stood. Aside the foes their mantles threw, Zaretsky paces thirty-two measured with great exactitude, at each extreme one takes his stand, a loaded pistol in his hand. 28. Advance. Indifferent and sedate, the foes, as yet not taking aim, with measured step and even gait, athwart the snow four paces came. Four deadly paces do they span. Onegin slowly then began to raise his pistol to his eye, though he advanced unceasingly. And, lo, five paces more they pass. And Lenski, closing his left eye, took aim, but as immediately Onegin fired. Alas, alas, the poet's hour has sounded. See, he drops his pistol silently. 29. He on his bosom gently placed his hand and fell, his clouded eye not agony, but death expressed. So from the mountain lazily the avalanche of snow first bends, then glittering in the sun descends, the cold sweat bursting from his brow. To the youth Eugene hurried now, gazed on him, called him. Useless care, he was no more. The youthful bard forevermore had disappeared. The storm was hushed. The blossom fair was withered ere the morning light. The altar flame was quenched in night. 30. Tranquil he lay, and strange to view the peace which on his forehead beamed, 
His breast was riddled through and through, The blood gushed from the wound and steamed. Ere this but one brief moment beat That heart with inspiration sweet And enmity and hope and love, The blood boiled and the passions strove. Now, as in a deserted house, All dark and silent hath become, The inmate is for ever dumb, The windows whitened, shutters close, Whither departed is the host? God knows, the very trace is lost. 31. Tis sweet the foe to aggravate With epigrams impertinent, Sweet to behold him obstinate, His butting horns in anger bent, The glass unwittingly inspect, And blush to own himself reflect. Sweeter it is, my friends, If he howl like a dolt, Tis meant for me, but sweeter still it is to arrange for him an honourable grave, at his pale brow a shot to have placed at the customary range, but home his body to dispatch can scarce in sweetness be a match. 32. Well, if your pistol-ball by chance the comrade of your youth should strike, who by a haughty word or glance or any trifle else yet like you or your wine insulted hath, or e'en overcome by wrath, scornfully challenged you afield. Tell me, of sentiments concealed, which of your spirit dominates, when motionless your gaze beneath he lies, upon his forehead death, and slowly life coagulates, when deaf and silent he doth lie heedless of your despairing cry. 33. Eugene, his pistol yet in hand, and with remorseful anguish filled, Gazing on Lenski's course did stand. Zaretsky shouted, Why, he's killed! Killed! At this dreadful exclamation Onegin went with trepidation and the attendants called in haste. Most carefully Zaretsky placed within his sledge the stiffened course, and hurried home his awful fright. Conscious of death approximate, loud paused the earth each panting horse, his bit with foam besprinkled o'er and homeward like an arrow tore. 34. My friends, the poet ye regret, when hope's delightful flower but bloomed in bud of promise incomplete, the manly toga scarce assumed, he perished, where his troubled dreams and where the admirable streams of youthful impulse, reverie, tender and elevated, free, and where tempestuous love's desires the thirst of knowledge and of fame, horror of sinfulness and shame, imagination's sacred fires, ye shadows of a life more high, ye dreams of heavenly poesy. 35. Perchance to benefit mankind, or, but for fame he saw the light, his lyre, to silence now consigned, resounding through all ages might have echoed to eternity. With worldly honours, it may be, fortune the poet had repaid. It may be that his martyred shade carried a truth divine away, that, for the century designed, had perished a creative mind. And past the threshold of decay he ne'er shall hear time's eulogy, the blessings of humanity. 36. Or, may it be, the bard had passed a life in common with the rest, Vanished his youthful years at last, The fire extinguished in his breast, And many things had changed his life, The muse abandoned, tain a wife, Inhabited the country, Clad in dressing-gown, a cuckold glad. A life of fact, not fiction, led, At forty suffered from the gout, Eaten, drunk, gossiped and grown stout, and finally, upon his bed, had finished life amid his sons, doctors and women, sobs and groans. 37. But howsoe'er his lot were cast, alas, the youthful lover slain, poetical enthusiast, a friendly hand thy life hath ta'en. There is a spot the village near, where dwelt the muses' worshipper, Two pines have joined their tangled roots, A rivulet beneath them shoots its waters to the neighboring vale. There the tired ploughman loves to lie, 
the reaping girls approach and ply within its wave the sounding pail, and by that shady rivulet a simple tombstone hath been set. 38. There, when the rains of spring we mark upon the meadows showering, the shepherd plates his shoe of bark, a Volga fisherman doth sing, and the young damsel from the town, from summer to the country flown, whene'er across the plain at speed alone she gallops on her steed, stops at the tomb in passing by. The tightened leathern rein she draws, aside she casts her veil of gauze, and reads with rapid eager eye the simple epitaph, a tear doth in her gentle eye appear. 39. And meditative from the spot, she leisurely away doth ride. Spite of herself, with Lenski's lot long time her mind is occupied. She muses, What was Olga's fate? Long time was her heart desolate, or did her tears soon cease to flow? And where may be her sister now? Where is the outlaw, banned by men, a fashionable dame's the foe, the misanthrope of gloomy brow, by whom the youthful bard was slain. In time I'll give ye, without fail, a true account, and in detail. 40. But not at present, though sincerely I on my chosen hero dote, though I'll return to him right early, just at this moment I cannot. Years have inclined me to stern prose, Years to light rhyme themselves oppose, And now, I mournfully confess, In rhyming I show laziness. As once to fill the rapid page My pen no longer finds delight, Other and colder thoughts affright, Sterner solicitudes engage, In worldly din or solitude Upon my visions such intrude. 41. Fresh aspirations I have known, I am acquainted with fresh care, Hopeless are all the first, I own, yet still remains the old despair. Illusions, dreams, where, where your sweetness? Where youth, the proper rhyme is fleetness. And is it true her garland bright at last is shrunk and withered quite? And is it true and not a jest, not even a poetic phrase, that vanished are my youthful days, this joking I used to protest? Never for me to reappear, that soon I reach my thirtieth year. 42. And so my noon hath come. If so, I must resign myself, in sooth. Yet let us part in friendship, O my frivolous and jolly youth. I thank thee for thy joyfulness, love's tender transports and distress, for riot, frolics, mighty feeds and all that from thy hand proceeds, I thank thee. In thy company, with tumult or contentment still of thy delights, I drank my fill. Enough. With tranquil spirit I commence a new career in life, and rest from bygone days of strife. 43. But pause. Thou calm retreats. Farewell where my days in the wilderness of languor and of love did tell and contemplative dreaminess. And thou, youth's early inspiration, invigorate imagination and spur my spirit's torpid mood. Fly frequent to my solitude. Let not the poet's spirit freeze, grow harsh and cruel, dead and dry, eventually petrify in the world's mortal reveries amid the soulless sons of pride and glittering simpletons beside. 44. Amid sly, pusillanimous, spoiled children, most degenerate and tiresome rogues, ridiculous, and stupid censors passionate, amid coquettes who pray to God and abject slaves who kiss the rod, in haunts of fashion where each day all with urbanity betray, where harsh frivolity proclaims its cold, unfeeling sentences, amid the awful emptiness of conversation, thought and aims, in that morass where you and I wallow, my friends, in company. End of Canto the Sixth Canto the Seventh, Moscow 1. Impelled by spring's dissolving beams, 
the snows from off the hills around descended in swift turbid streams and flooded all the level ground a smile from slumbering nature clear did seem to greet the youthful year the heavens shone in deeper blue the woods still naked to the view seemed in a haze of green embowered the bee forth from his cell of wax flew to collect his rural tax the valleys dried and gaily flowered herds low and under night's dark veil already sings the nightingale two mournful is thine approach to me o spring thou chosen time of love what agitation languidly my spirit and my blood doth move what sad emotions o'er me steal when first upon my cheek i feel the breath of spring again renewed secure in rural quietude or strange to me is happiness do all things which to mirth inclined and make a dark existence shine inflict annoyance and distress upon a soul inert and cloyed and is all light within destroyed three or heedless of the leaves return which autumn late to earth consigned do we alone our losses mourn of which the rustling woods remind or when anew all nature teems do we foresee in troubled dreams the coming of life's autumn drear for which no springtime shall appear or may it be we inly seek wafted upon poetic wing some other long departed spring whose memories make the heart be quick with thoughts of a far distant land of a strange night when the moon and four tis now the season idlers all epicurean philosophers ye men of fashion cynical of levishan's school ye followers priams of country populations and dames of fine organizations spring summons you to her green bowers tis the warm time of labor flowers the time for mystic strolls which late into the starry night extend quick to the country let us wend in vehicles surcharged with freight in coach or post-cart duly placed beyond the city barriers haste five thou also reader generous the chaise long ordered please employ abandon cities riotous which in the winter were a joy the muse capricious let us coax go hear the rustling of the oaks beside a nameless rivulet where in the country eugene yet an idle anchorite and sad a while ago the winter spent near young tatiana resident my pretty self-deceiving maid no more the village knows his face for there he left a mournful trace let us proceed unto a rill which in a hilly neighborhood seeks winding amid meadows still the river through the linden wood the nightingale there all night long spring's paramour pours forth her song the fountain brawls sweet briars bloom and lo where lies a marble tomb and two old pines their branches spread vladimir lensky lies beneath who early died a gallant death thereon the passing traveller read the date his fleeting years how long repose in peace thou child of song seven time was the breath of early dawn would agitate a mystic wreath hung on a pine branch earthward drawn above the humble urn of death time was two maids from their home at eventide would hither come and by the light the moonbeams gave lament embrace upon that grave but now none heeds the monument of woe effaced the pathway now there is no wreath upon the bough alone beside it gray and bent as formerly the shepherd sits and his poor baston sandals knits eight my poor vladimir bitter tears thee but a space bewept faithless alas thy maid appears nor true unto her sorrow kept another could her heart engage another could her woe assuage by flattery and lover's art a lancer captivates her heart a lancer her soul dotes upon before the altar lo the pair mark ye with what modest air she bows her head beneath the crown behold her downcast eyes which glow her lips where light smiles come and go 
9. My poor Vladimir, in the tomb, passed into dull eternity, was the sad poet filled with gloom, hearing the fatal perfidity? Or, beyond Lethe lulled to rest, hath the bard, by indifference blessed, callous to all on earth become? Is the world to him sealed and dumb? The same unmoved oblivion on us beyond the grave attends. The voice of lovers, foes, and friends dies suddenly. Of heirs alone remain on earth the unseemly rage, while struggling for the heritage. 10. Soon Olga's accents shrill resound no longer through her former home. The lancer, to his calling bound, back to his regiment must roam. The aged mother, bathed in tears, distracted by her grief appears when the hour came to bid good-bye. But my Tatiana's eyes were dry. Only her countenance assumed a deadly pallor, air distressed, when all around the entrance pressed, to say farewell, and fussed, and fumed around the carriage of the pair, Tatiana gently led them there. 11. And long her eyes as through a haze after the wedded couple strain. Alas! The friend of childish days away, Tatiana, hath been ta'en. Thy dove, thy darling little pet, on whom a sister's heart was set, afar is borne by cruel fate, for evermore is separate. She wanders aimless as a sprite, into the tangled garden goes, but nowhere can she find repose, nor even tears afford respite, of consolation all bereft, well nigh her heart in twain was cleft. 12. In cruel solitude each day with flame more ardent passion burns, and to Onegin far away her heart importunately turns. She never more his face may view, for was it not her duty to detest him for a brother slain? The poet fell, already men no more remembered him, unto another his betrothed was given. The memory of the bard was driven like smoke athwart the heaven blue. Two hearts perchance were desolate and mourned him still. Why mourn his fate? 13. T'was eve, t'was dusk. The river speeds in tranquil flow. The beetle hums. Already dance to song proceeds. The fisher's fire afar illumes the river's bank. Tatiana alone beneath the silver of the moon, long time in meditation deep, her path across the plain doth keep, proceeds, until she from a hill sees where a noble mansion stood, a village, and beneath a wood, a garden by a shining rill. She gazed thereon, and instant beat her heart more loudly and more fleet. 14. She hesitates, in doubt is thrown, Shall I proceed, or homeward flee? He is not there. I am not known. The house and garden I would see. Tatiana from the hill descends with bated breath. Around she bends a countenance perplexed and scared. She enters a deserted yard. Yelping, a pack of dogs rush out. But at her shriek ran forth with noise the household troop of little boys, who with a scuffle and a shout the curs away to kennel chase, the damsel under escort place. 15. Can I inspect the mansion, please? Tatiana asks, and hurriedly unto Anisia for the keys the family of the children high. Anisia soon appears, the door opens under her visitor. Into the lonely house she went, where in a space Onegin spent. She gazed, a cue, forgotten long, doth on the billiard-table rest, upon the tumbled sofa placed a riding-whip. She strolls along. The bedlam saith, The hearth. By it the master always used to sit. 16. Departed Lenski here to dine in winter-time would often come. Please follow this way, lady mine. This is my master's sitting-room. Tis here he slept, his coffee took, into accounts would sometimes look, a book at early morn perused. The room my former master used, on Sundays by yon window he, spectacles upon nose, all day was wont with me at cards to play. 
God save his soul eternally, and grant his weary bones their rest, deep in our mother earth's chill breast. 17. Tatiana's eyes with tender gleam on everything around her gaze. Of priceless value all things seem, and in her languid bosom raise a pleasure though with sorrow knit. The table with its lamp unlit, the pile of books, with carpet spread beneath the window sill his bed, the landscape which the moonbeams fret, the twilight pale which softens all, Lord Byron's portrait on the wall, and the cast iron statuette with folded arms and eyes bent low, cocked hat and melancholy brow. 18. Long in this fashionable cell, Tatiana as enchanted stood. But it grew late, cold blew the gale, dark was the valley and the wood slept o'er the river misty grown behind the mountain sank the moon long long the hour had passed when home our youthful wanderer should roam she hid the trouble of her breast heaved an involuntary sigh and turned to leave immediately but first permission did request thither in future to proceed that certain volumes she might read nineteen Adieu, she to the matron said at the front gates, but in brief space at early morn returns the maid to the abandoned dwelling place, when in the study's calm retreat, wrapped in oblivion complete, she found herself alone at last, long time her tears flowed thick and fast. But presently she tried to read. At first her books was disinclined, but soon their choice seemed to her mind remarkable. She then indeed devoured them with an eager zest. A new world was made manifest. 20. Although we know that Eugene had long ceased to be a reading man, certain authors, I may add, he had accepted from the ban. The Bard of Juan and the Gior, with it may be a couple more. Romances three, in which she scanned portrayed contemporary man as the reflection of his age, his immortality of mind to arid selfishness resigned, a visionary personage with his exasperated sense, his energy and impotence. 21. And numerous pages had preserved the sharp incisions of his nail, and these the attentive maid observed with eye precise and without fail. Tatiana saw with trepidation by what idea or observation Onegin was the most impressed in what he merely acquiesced. Upon those margins she perceived Onegin's pencilings. His mind made revelations undesigned, of what he thought and what believed, a dagger, asterisk, or note, interrogation to denote. 22. And my Tatiana now began to understand by slow degrees, more clearly, God be praised, the man, whom autocratic fate's decrees had bid her sigh for without hope, a dangerous, gloomy misanthrope, being from hell or heaven sent, angel or fiend malevolent. Which is he? Or an imitation, a bogey conjured up in joke, a Russian in Child Harold's cloak, of foreign whims the impersonation, handbook of fashionable phrase, or parody of modern ways. 23. Has she found out the riddle yet? Has she a fitting phrase selected? But time flies and she doth forget they long at home have her expected. Whither two neighboring dames have walked and a long time about her talked. What can be done? She is no child, cries the old dame with anguish filled. Olinka is her junior, see? Tis time to marry her, tis true. But tell me what am I to do? To all she answers cruelly, I will not wed, and ever weeps, and lonely through the forest creeps. 24. Is she in love? quoth one. With whom? Boyanov courted, she refused. Petrushkov met the self-same doom. The hussar Pitkin was accused. How the young Ip on Tanya doted, to captivate her how devoted. I mused, Perhaps the matter squared. Oh, yes, my hopes soon disappeared. But, Matushka, to Moscow you should go, the market for a maid, 
with many a vacancies, tis said. Alas, my friend, no revenue. Enough to see one winter's end. If not, the money I will lend. 25. The venerable dame opined the counsel good and full of reason. Her money counted, and designed to visit Moscow in the season. Tatiana learns the intelligence. Of her provincial innocence the unaffected traits she now unto a carping world must show. Her toilet's antiquated style, her antiquated mode of speech. For Moscow fops and Circe's each to mark with a contemptuous smile. Whore! Had she not better stay deep in the greenwood far away? 26. Arising with the morning's light, unto the fields she makes her way, and with emotional delight surveying them, she thus doth say, Ye peaceful valleys all, good-bye, ye well-known mountain summits high, ye groves whose depths I know so well, thy beauteous sky above, farewell, Delicious nature, thee I fly, the calm existence which I prize I yield for splendid vanities. Thou too, farewell, my liberty. Whither and wherefore do I speed, and what will destiny concede? 27. Farther Tatiana's walks extend. Tis now the hillock, now the rill, their natural attractions lend to stay the maid against her will. She the acquaintances she loves, Her spacious fields and shady groves, Another visit haste to pay. But summer swiftly fades away, And golden autumn draweth nigh, And pallid nature trembling grieves, The victim decked with golden leaves. Dark clouds before the north wind fly, It blew, it howled, Till winter e'en came forth In all her magic sheen. 28. The snow descends and buries all, Hangs heavy on the oaken boughs, A white and undulating pall O'er hillock and o'er meadow throws, The channel of the river stilled As with eider down is filled, The hoar-frost glitters, All rejoice in mother winter's strange caprice, But Tanya's heart is not at ease. Winter's approach she doth not hail, Nor the frost particles inhale, Nor the first snow of winter sees her shoulders, breast and face to lave. Alarm the winter's journey gave. 29. The date was fixed, though oft postponed, but ultimately doth approach. Examined, mended, newly found was the old and forgotten coach. Kibitkas three, the accustomed train, the household property contain. Saucepans and mattresses and chairs, portmanteaus and preserves in jars, Feather beds, also poultry coops, basins and jugs. Well, everything to happiness contributing. Behold, beside their dwelling groups of serfs the farewell wail have given. Nags eighteen to the door are driven. 30. These to the coach of state are bound. Breakfast the busy cooks prepare. Baggage is heaped up in a mound. Old women at the coachman swear. A bearded postilion astride a lean and shaggy nag doth ride. Unto the gates the servants fly to bid the gentlefolk good-bye. These take their seats. The coach of state leisurely through the gateway glides. Adieu, thou home where peace abides, where turmoil cannot penetrate. Shall I behold thee once again? Tatiana tears cannot restrain. 31. The limits of enlightenment, when to enlarge we shall succeed, in course of time, the whole extent will not five centuries exceed by computation, it is like our roads transformed the eye will strike, highways all Russia will unite and form a network left and right, iron bridges we shall gaze which o'er the waters boldly leap, mountains will level, and through deep streams excavate subaqueous ways, and Christian folk will, I expect, and in at every stage erect. 32. But now, what wretched roads one sees, Our bridges long neglected rot, And at the stages bugs and fleas One moment's slumber suffer not. Inns there are none, Pretentious but meagre, With a draughty hut, 
a bill of fare hangs full in sight and irritates the appetite. Meantime a cyclops of those parts, before a fire which feebly glows, mends with the Russian hammer's blows the flimsy wares of western marts, with blessings on the ditches and the ruts of his own fatherland. 33. Yet on a frosty winter day the journey in a sledge doth please. No senseless fashionable lay glides with a more luxurious ease. For our Ottomendans are fire, and our swift triocas never tire. The versed posts catch the vacant eye, and like a placitude flit by. The Lorenas unwisely went, from apprehension of the cost, by their own horses, not the post. So Tanya to her heart's content could taste the pleasures of the road. Seven days and nights the travellers plod. 36. But they draw near. Before them, lo, white Moscow raises her old spires, whose countless golden crosses glow as with innumerable fires. Ah, brethren, what was my delight when I yon semicircle bright of churches, gardens, belfries high descried before me suddenly? Moscow, how oft in evil days, condemned to exile dire by fate, on thee I used to meditate. Moscow, how much is in the phrase for every loyal Russian breast? How much is in that word expressed? 35. Lo, compassed by his grove of oaks, Petrovsky place, gloomily his recent glory he invokes. Here, drunk with his late victory, Napoleon tarried till it pleased Moscow approach on bended knees. Time-honored Kremlin's keys present. Not so. My Moscow never went to seek him out with bended head. No gifts she bears, no feast proclaims, but lights incendiary flames for the impatient chief instead. From hence engrossed in thought profound, he on the conflagration frowned. 36. Adieu, thou witness of our glory. Petrovsky place, come, astir. Drive on, the city barriers hoary appear. Along the road of Tver the coach is borne o'er ruts and holes, past women, sentry-boxes, rolls, past palaces and nunneries, lamp-posts, shops, sledges, families, Boharians, peasants, beds of greens, boulevards, belfries, milliners, huts, chemists, cossacks, shopkeepers and fashionable magazines, balconies, lions' heads on doors, jackdaws in every spire, in scores. 37. The weary way still incomplete, an hour passed by, another, till, near Caritans on a side street, the coach before a house stood still. At an old aunt's they had arrived, who had for four long years survived an invalid from a lung complaint. A Kalmuk gray, in caftan rent and spectacles, his knitting stayed, and the salon threw open wide. The princess from the sofa cried, and the newcomers welcome bade. The two old ladies then embraced, and exclamations interlaced. 38. Princess Monange. Pachette. A line. Who would have thought it, as of yore? Is it for long? Ma chère cousin. Sit down. How funny, to be sure. Tis a scene of romance, I vow. Tanya, my eldest child, you know. Ah, come, Tatiana, come to me. Is it a dream, and can it be? Cousin, remembers Grandison. What? Grandison? Yes, certainly. Oh, I remember. Where is he? Here. He resides with Simeon. He called upon me Christmas Eve. His son is married. Just conceive. 39. And he, but have him presently. Tomorrow, Tanya, we will show. What say you to the family? Alas, a broad eye cannot go. See, I hardly crawl about. But you must both be quite tired out. Let us go seek a little rest. Ah, I am so weak, my throbbing breast. Oppressive now is happiness, not only sorrow. Ah, my dear, now I am fit for nothing here. In old age life is weariness. Then weeping she sank back distressed, and fits of coughing racked her chest. 
40. By the sick lady's gaiety and kindness Tanya was impressed, but her own room in memory, the strange apartment her oppressed. Repose her silken curtains fled, she could not sleep in her new bed. The early tinkling of the bells which of approaching labor tells aroused Tatiana from her bed. The maiden at her casement sits as daylight glimmers, darkness flits, but ah, discerns nor wood nor mead, beneath her lay a strange courtyard, a stable, kitchen, fence appeared. 41. To consanguineous dinners they conduct Tatiana constantly, that grandmothers and grandsires may contemplate her sad reverie. We Russians, friends from distant parts, ever receive with kindly hearts and exclamations and good cheers. How Tanya grows! Doth it appear long since I held thee at the font, since in these arms thee I did bear, and since I pulled thee by the ear, and I to give thee cakes was wont? Then the old dames in chorus sing, Oh, how our years are vanishing! 42. But nothing changed in them is seen. All in the good old style appears. Our dear old aunt, Princess Helene, her cap of tulle still ever wears. Lucera Lvovna paint applies. Amy Petrovna utter lies. Ivan Petrovitch still a gabby. Simon Petrovitch just as shabby. Pelagie Nikolovna has her friend Monsieur Philomoud the same, her wolf dog and her husband tame. Still of his club he member was, as deaf and silly doth remain, still eats and drinks enough for twain. 43. Their daughters kiss Tatiana fair, in the beginning, cold and mute, Moscow's young graces at her stare, examine her from head to foot. They deem her somewhat finical, outlandish and provincial, a trifle pale, a trifle lean, but plainer girls they oft have seen. Obedient then to nature's law, with her they did associate, squeeze tiny hands and osculate, her tresses curled in fashion saw, and often whispers would impart a maiden secrets of the heart. 44. Triumphs, their own or those of friends, hopes, frolics, dreams and sentiment, their harmless conversation blends with scandal's trivial ornament. Then, to reward such confidence, her amorous experience with mute appeal to ask them seem. But Tanya, just as in a dream, without participation, hears. Their voices not to her impart, and the lone secret of her heart, her sacred hoard of joy and tears, she buries deep within her breast, nor aught confides unto the rest. 45. Tatiana would have gladly heard the converse of the world polite, but in the drawing-room all appeared to find in gossip such delight. Speech was so tame and colourless, their slander even was weariness. In the sterility of prattle, questions and news and tittle-tattle, no sense was ever manifest, though by an error and unsought, the languid mind could smile at naught, heart would not throb, albeit in jest. Even amusing fools we miss in thee, thou world of empty bliss. 46. In groups, official striplings glance conceitedly on Tanya Fair, and views amongst themselves advance unfavorable unto her. But one buffoon unhappy deemed her the ideal which he dreamed, and leading gainst the portal closed to her an elegy composed. Also one Biazemsky, remarking Tatiana by a poor aunt's side, successfully to please her tried, and an old gent the poet marking by Tanya, smoothing his peruke, to ask her name the trouble took. 47. But where Melpomene doth rave with lengthened howl and accent loud, and her bespangled robe doth wave before a cold indifferent crowd, and where Thalia softly dreams and heedless of approval seems, Terpsichore alone among her sisterhood delights the young. So twas with us in former years, in your young days and also mine. Never upon my heroine the jealous dame her lorgnette veers, the connoisseur his glances throws from boxes or from stalls in rows. 48. To the assembly her they bear. There the confusion, pressure, heat, the crash of music, Candles glare and rapid whirl of many feet, the ladies' dresses airy, light, 
the motley moving mass and bright, young ladies in a vastly curve to strike the imagination serve. Tis there that errant fops display their insolence and waistcoats white, and glasses unemployed all night. Thither who sares on leave will stray to clank the spur, delight the fair, and vanish like a bird in air. 49. For many a lovely star hath night and Moscow many a beauty fair. Yet clearer shines than every light the moon in that blue atmosphere. And she to whom my lyre would fain, yet dares not, dedicate its strain, shines in the female firmament like a full moon magnificent. Lo! with what pride celestial her feet the earth beneath her press, her heart how full of gentleness, her glance how wild yet genial. Enough, enough, conclude thy lay, for folly's dues thou hast to pay. 50. Noise, laughter, bowing, hurrying mixed, gallop, mazurka, waltzing, see, a pillar by, two ants betwixt, Tanya, observed by nobody, looks upon all with absent gaze, and hates the world's discordant ways. Tis noisome to her there. In thought again her rural life she sought, the hamlet, the poor villagers, the little solitary nook where shining runs the tiny brook, her garden, and those books of hers, and the lime alley's twilight dim, where first time she met with him. 51. Thus widely meditation erred, forgot the world, the noisy ball, whilst from her countenance ne'er stirred the eyes of a grave general. Both aunts looked knowing as a judge. Each gave Tatiana's arm a nudge, and in a whisper did repeat, Look quickly to your left, my sweet. The left? Why, what on earth is there? No matter, look immediately. There, in that knot of company, two dressed in uniform appear. Ah, he has gone the other way. Who? Is it that stout general, pray? 52. Let us congratulations pay to our Tatiana's conquering, and for a time our course delay, that I forget not whom I sing. Let me explain that in my song I celebrate a comrade young and the extent of his caprice. O epic muse, my powers increase and grant success to labor long, having a trusty staff bestowed, grant that I err not on the road. Enough, my pack is now unslung. To classicism I've homage paid, though late, having a beginning made. End of Canto the Seventh Canto the Eighth The Great World 1. In Lyceum's noiseless shade, as in a garden when I grew, I, Apelius, gladly read, but would not look at Cicero. "'Twas then in valleys lone, remote, in springtime, "'heard the signet's note by water shining tranquilly, "'that first the muse appeared to me. "'Into the study of the boy there came a sudden flash of light. "'The muse revealed her first delight, "'sang childhood's pastimes and its joy, "'glory with which our history teems and the heart's agitated dreams.' Two, and the world met her smilingly, at first success light pinions gave. The old Derjavine noticed me and blessed me, sinking to the grave. Then my companion, young with pleasure, in the unfettered hours of leisure her utterances ever heard, and by a partial temper stirred and boiling o'er with friendly heat, they first of all my brow did wreathe and an encouragement did breathe that my coy muse might sing more sweet. O oh, triumphs of my guileless days! How sweet a dream your memories raise! 3. Passion's wild sway I then allowed, Her promptings unto law did make, Pursuits I followed of the crowd, My sportive muse I used to take To many a noisy feast and fight, Terror of guardians of the night. And wild festivities among she brought with her the gift of song. 
like a bacante in her sport beside the cup she sang her rhymes and the young revellers of pastimes vociferously paid her court and i amid the friendly crowd of my light paramour was proud four but i abandoned their array and fled afar she followed me how oft the kindly muse away hath wild the road's monotony entranced me by some mystic tale how oft beneath the moonbeams pale like leonora did she ride with me caucasian rocks beside how oft to the crimean shore she led me through nocturnal mist unto the sounding sea to list where nereids murmur evermore and where the billows hoarsely raise to god eternal hymns of praise five then the far capital forgot its splendor and its blandishments in poor moldovia cast her lot she visited the humble tents of migratory gypsy hordes and wild among them grew her words our godlike tongue she could exchange for savage speech uncouth and strange and ditties of the steppe she loved but suddenly all changed around lo in my garden she was found and as a country damsel roved a pensive sorrow in her glance and in her hand a french romance six now for the first time i my muse lead into good society her step-like beauties i peruse with jealous fear anxiety through dense aristocratic rows of diplomats and warlike bows and supercilious dames she glides sits down and gazes on all sides amazed at the confusing crowd variety of speech and vests deliberate approach of guests who to the youthful hostess bowed and the dark fringe of men like frames enclosing pictures of fair dames seven assemblies oligarchical please her by their decorum fixed the rigor of cold pride and all titles and ages intermixed but who in that choice company with clouded brow stands silently unknown to all he doth appear a vision desolate and drear doth seem to him the festal scene doth his brow wretchedness declare or suffering pride why is he there who may he be is it eugene pray is it he it is the same and is it long since back he came Eight. is he the same or grown more wise still doth the misanthrope appear he has returned say in what guise what is his latest character what doth he act is it melmoth philanthropist or patriot child herald quaker devotee or other mask donned playfully or a good fellow for the nonce like you and me and all the rest but this is my advice twere best not to behave as he did once society he duped now is he known to you yes and no nine wherefore regarding him express perverse unfavorable views is it that human restlessness for ever carps condemns pursues is it that ardent souls of flame by reckless amuse or shame selfish nonentities around that mind which yearns for space is bound and that too oft we receive professions eagerly for deeds that crass stupidity misleads that we by cant ourselves deceive that mediocrity alone without disgust we look upon ten happy he who in youth was young happy who timely grew mature he whose life frosts which early rung hath gradually learnt to endure by visions who was ne'er deranged nor from the mob polite estranged at twenty who was prig or swell at thirty who was married well at fifty who relief obtained from public and from private ties 
who glory, wealth, and dignities hath tranquilly in turn attained, and unto whom we all allude as to a worthy man and good. 11. But sad is the reflection made, in vain was youth by us received, that we her constantly betrayed, and she at last hath us deceived that our desires which noblest seemed, the purest of the dreams we dreamed, have one by one all withered grown, like rotten leaves by autumn strown. Tis fearful to anticipate naught but of dinners a long row, to look on life as on a show, eternally to imitate the seeming crowd, partaking not its passions and its modes of thought. The butt of scandal having been, Tis dreadful, ye agree, I hope, To pass with reasonable men For a fictitious misanthrope, A visionary mortified Or monster of satanic pride, Or e'en the demon of my strain. Onegin, take him up again. In duel having killed his friend And reached, with not his mind to engage, The twenty-sixth year of his age, Wearied of leisure in the end, Without profession, business, wife, He knew not how to spend his life. 13. Him a disquietude did seize, A wish from place to place to roam, A very troubling disease, In some a willing martyrdom. Abandoned he his country seat, Of woods and fields the calm retreat, Where every day before his eyes A blood-bespattered shade would rise, and aimless journeys did commence, but still remembrance to him clings, his travels, like all other things, inspired but weariness intense. Returning, from his ship amid a ball he fell, as Trotsky did. 14. Behold, the crowd begins to stir, a whisper runs along the hall, a lady draws the hostess near, behind her a grave general. Her manners were deliberate, reserved, but not inanimate. Her eyes no saucy glance address, there was no angling for success. Her features no grimaces bleared, of affectation innocent. Calm and without embarrassment, a faithful model she appeared of Comilfont. Shiskov, forgive, I can't translate the adjective. 15. Ladies in crowds around her close, Her with a smile old women greet, The men salute with lower bows And watch her eyes full glance to meet. Maidens before her meekly move along the hall, And high above the crowd doth head and shoulders rise The general who accompanies. None could her beautiful declare, Yet viewing her from head to foot, None could a trace of that impute, which in the elevated sphere of London life is vulgar called, and ruthless fashion hath blackballed. 16. I like this word exceedingly, although it will not bear translation. With us tis quite a novelty not in high general estimation. T'would serve ye in an epigram. But turn we once more to our dam. Enchanting, but unwittingly, at table she was sitting by the brilliant Nina Vronsky, the Neva's Cleopatra, and none the conviction could withstand that Nina's marble symmetry, though dazzling its effulgence white, could not eclipse her neighbor's light. 17. And is it, meditates Eugene, and is it she? It must be. No, how, from the waste of steps unseen, and the eternal lorgnette through frequent and rapid doth his gaze seek the forgotten countenance familiar to him long ago. Inform me, prince, pray dost thou know the lady in the crimson cap, who with the Spanish envoy speaks? The prince's eye Onegin seeks. Ah, long the world hath missed thy shape, but stop. I will present thee, if thou choose. But who is she? My wife. 
18. So thou art wed? I did not know. Long ago? Tis the second year. To... Larina. Tatiana? So, and dost thou know her? We live near. Then come with me. The prince proceeds, his wife approaches, with him leads his relative and friend as well. The lady's glance upon him fell, and though her soul might be confused, and vehemently though amazed she on the apparition gazed, no signs of trouble her accused. A mien unaltered she preserved, her bow was easy, unreserved. 19. Ah, no! No faintness her attacked, nor sudden turn she red or white. Her brow she did not e'en contract, nor yet her lip compressed did bite. Though he surveyed her at his ease, not the least trace Onegin sees of the Tatiana of times fled. He conversation would have led, but could not. Then she questioned him. Had he been here long, and where from? Straight from their province had he come. Cast upwards then her eyeballs dim unto her husband. Went away. Transfixed Onegin mind doth stay. 20. Is this the same Tatiana, say, Before whom once in solitude, In the beginning of this lay, Deep in the distant province rude, Impelled by zeal for moral worth, he salutary rules poured forth. The maid whose note he still possessed, Where in the heart its vows expressed, Where all upon the surface lies, That girl, but he must dreaming be, That girl whom once on a time He could in a humble sphere despise, Can she have been a moment gone, Thus haughty, careless in her tone? 21. He quits the fashionable throng, And meditative homeward goes. Visions, now sad, now grateful, Long do agitate his late repose. He wakes. They with a letter come. The Princess N. will be at home on such a day. Oh, heavens! Tis she! Oh, I accept! And instantly he a polite reply doth scrawl, what hath he dreamed? What hath occurred? In the recesses what hath stirred Of a heart cold and cynical? Vexation? Vanity? Or strove again the plague of boyhood? Love? 22. The hours once more Onegin counts. Impatient waits the close of day. But ten strikes and his sledge he mounts And gallops to her house away. Trembling he seeks the young princess, Tatiana finds in loneliness. Together moments one or two they sat, But conversation's flow deserted Eugene. He, distraught, sits by her gloomily, Desponds, scarce to her questions he responds, Full of exasperating thought. He fixedly upon her stares. She calm and unconcerned appears. 23. The husband comes and interferes with this unpleasant tete-a-tete. -tete. With Eugene, pranks of former years and jests doth recapitulate. They talked and laughed. The guests arrived. The conversation was revived by the course of wit and worldly hate, but round the hostess scintillate light sallies without coxcombry. A while sound conversation seems to banish far unworthy themes, and platitudes and pedantry, and never was the ear of fright by liberties, or loose, or light. 14. And yet the city's flower was there, noblesse and models of the mode, faces which we meet everywhere in necessary fools allowed, Behold the dames who once were fine with roses, caps and looks malign. Some marriageable maids behold, blank, unapproachable, and cold. Lo, the ambassador who speaks economy political, 
and with grey hair ambrosial the old man who has had his freaks, renowned for his acumen, wit, but now ridiculous a bit. 25. Behold Sabaroff, whom the age for baseness of the spirit scorns, Saint Priest, who every album's page with blunted pencil point adorns. Another tribune of the ball hung like a print against the wall, pink as Palm Sunday cherubim, motionless, mute, tight laced and trim. The traveller, bird of passage, he, stiff, overstarched and insolent, awakened secret merriment by his embarrassed dignity. Mute glances interchanged aside meet punishment for him provide. 26. But my Onegin the whole eve within his mind Tatiana bore. Not the young timid maid, believe, enamoured, simple-minded, poor, but the indifferent princess, divinity without access of the imperial Neva's shore. O oh, men, how very like ye are to Eve, the universal mother! Possession hath no power to please. The serpent to unlawful trees I bids ye in some way or other. Unless forbidden fruit we eat, our paradise is no more sweet. 27. Ah, how Tatiana was transformed! How thoroughly her part she took! How soon to habits she conformed with crushing dignity must brook. Who would the maiden innocent, in the unmoved, magnificent autocrat of the drawing-room seek? And he who had made her heart beat quick. T'was he, amid nightly shades, whilst Morpheus his approach delays, she mourned, and to the morn would raise the languid eye of lovesick maids, Dreaming perchance in weal or woe to end with him her path below. Twenty eight. To love all ages lowly bend, but the young unpolluted heart his gusts should fertilize, amend, as vernal storms the fields athwart. Young freshens beneath passion's showers, develops and matures its powers and thus in season the rich field gay flowers and luscious fruit doth yield. But at a later, sterile age, the solstice of our earthly years, mournful love's deadly trace appears as storms which in chill autumn rage and leave a marsh the fertile ground and devastate the woods around. 29. There was no doubt, Eugene, alas, Tatiana loved as when a lad. Both day and night he now must pass in lovelorn meditation sad. Careless of every social rule, the crystals of her vestibule he daily in his drives drew near and like a shadow haunted her. Enraptured was he if allowed to swathe her shoulders in the furs, if his hot hand encountered hers, or he dispersed the motley crowd of lackeys in her pathway grouped, or to pick up her kerchief stooped. 30. She seemed of him oblivious, despite the anguish of his breast, received him freely at her house, at times three words to him addressed, in company, or simply bowed, or recognized not in the crowd. No coquetry was there, I vouch, society endures not such. Onegin's cheek grew ashly pale. Either she saw not, or ignored. Onegin wasted. On my word, already he grew physical. All to the doctors Eugene send, and they the waters recommend. 31. He went not. Sooner was prepared to write his forefathers to warn of his approach, but nothing cared Tatiana. Thus the sex is born. He obstinately will remain, still hopes, endeavors, though in vain. Sickness more courage doth command than health, so with a trembling hand a love epistle he doth scrawl. Though correspondence as a rule he used to hate, and was no fool, 
yet suffering emotional had rendered him an invalid, but word for word his letter read. Onegin's Letter to Tatiana All is foreseen. My secret drear will sound an insult in your ear. What acrimonious scorn I trace depicted on your haughty face. What do I ask? What cause assigned that I to you reveal my mind? To what malicious merriment, it may be, I yield nutriment? Meeting you in times past by chance, warmth I imagined in your glance, but, knowing not the actual truth, restrained the impulses of youth. Also my wretched liberty I would not part with finally. This separates us as well. Lenski, unhappy victim, fell. From everything the heart held dear, I then resolved my heart to tear. Unknown to all, without a tie, I thought, retirement, liberty, will happiness replace. My God, how I have erred and felt the rod. No, ever to behold your face, to follow you in every place, your smiling lips, your beaming eyes, to watch with lovers' ecstasies, long listen, comprehend the whole of your perfections in my soul, before you agonize to die, this, this were true felicity. But such is not for me. I brood daily of love in solitude. My days of life approach their end. Yet I in idleness expend the remnant destiny concedes, And thus each stubbornly proceeds. I feel, allotted is my span, But, that life longer may remain, At morn I must assuredly know That thy face that day I see. I tremble lest my humble prayer You with stern countenance declare The artifice of villainy. I hear your harsh, reproachful cry, if ye but knew how dreadful tis to bear love's parching agonies, to burn, yet reason keeps awake the fever of the blood to slake, a passionate desire to bend and, sobbing at your feet, to blend entreaties, woes, and prayers, confess all that the heart would fain express, yet with a feigned frigidity to arm the tongue and e'en the eye, to be in conversation clear and happy unto you appear. So be it, but internal strife I cannot longer wage concealed. The die is cast, thine is my life, into thy hands my fate I yield. Thirty two. No answer. He another sent. Epistle second. Note the third. Remained unnoticed. Once he went to an assembly. She appeared just as he entered. How severe! She will not see, she will not hear. Alas, she is as hard, behold, And frosty as a twelfth night cold. Oh, how her lips compressed restrain The indignation of her heart! A sidelong look doth Eugene dart. Where, where, remorse, Compassion? Pain? Where? Where? The trace of tears? None. None. Upon her brow sits wrath alone. 33. And it may be a secret dread, Lest the world or her lord divine A certain little escapade Well known unto Onegin's mine. Tis hopeless. Homeward doth he flee, Cursing his own stupidity, And brooding o'er the ills he bore, Society renounced once more. Then in the silent cabinet He in imagination saw The time when melancholy's claw Mid worldly pleasures chased him yet, Caught him, and by their collar took and shut him in a lonely nook. 34. He read as vainly as before, perusing Gibbon and Rousseau, 
Manzoni, Herder, and Chamfort, Madame de Stahl, Bichat to Sot. He read the unbelieving Bale, also the works of Fontenelle. Some Russian authors he perused, not in the universe refused. Nor almanacs, nor newspapers, which lessons unto us repeat, wherein I castigation get, and where a madrigal occurs writ in my honour now and then. E. Sempre Beni, Gentlemen. 35. But what results? His eyes peruse, but thoughts meander far away. Ideas, desires, and woes confuse his intellect in close array. His eyes, the printed lines betwixt, on lines invisible are fixed. Twas these he read, and these alone his spirit was intent upon. They were the wonderful traditions of kindly, dim antiquity, dreams with no continuity, prophecies, threats and apparitions, the lively trash of stories long or letters of a maiden young. 36. And by degrees upon him grew a lethargy of sense, a trance, and soon imaginations threw before him her wild game of chance. And now upon the snow in thaw a young man motionless he saw, as one who bouviacs a field, and heard a cry, Why, he's killed! And now he views forgotten foes, poltroons and men of slanderous tongue, bevies of treacherous maidens young, of thankless friends the circle rose, a mansion, by the window, see, she sits alone, tis ever she. 37. So frequently his mind would stray, he well nigh lost the use of sense, almost became a poet, say. Oh, what had been his eminence? Indeed, by force of magnetism a Russian poem's mechanism my scholar without aptitude at this time almost understood. How like a poet was my chum when, sitting by his fire alone whilst cheerily the embers shone, he, Benedetta, used to hum, or idol mio, and in the grate would lose his slippers or gazette. 38. Time flies, a genial air abroad, winter resigned her empire white, Onegin ne'er as poet showed, nor died, nor lost his senses quite. Spring cheered him up, and he resigned his chamber's clothes wherein confined he marmot-like did hibernate, his double sashes and his grate, and sallied forth one brilliant morn, along the Nevis bank he slays, on the blue blocks of ice the rays of the sun glisten, muddy, worn, the snow upon the streets doth melt, whither along them doth he pelt? 39. Onegin whither gallops? Ye have guessed already. Yes, quite so. Unto his own Tatiana he, incorrigible rogue, doth go. Her house he enters, ghastly white, the vestibule finds empty quite. He enters the saloon, tis blank. A door he opens, but why shrank he back as from a sudden blow? Alone the princess sitteth there, pallid and with dishevelled hair, gazing upon a note below. Her tears flow plentifully, and her cheek reclines upon her hand. 40. Oh, who her speechless agonies could not in that brief moment guess! Who could now fail to recognize Tatiana in the young princess? Tortured by pangs of wild regret, Eugene fell prostrate at her feet. She starts, nor doth a word express, but gazes on Onegin's face without amaze or wrath displayed. His sunken eye and aspect faint, imploring looks and mute complaint she comprehends. The simple maid by fond illusions once possessed is once again made manifest. 41. His kneeling posture he retains. Calmly her eyes encounter his. Insensible her hand remains beneath his lips' devouring kiss. What visions then her fancy thronged, 
a breathless silence then prolonged but finally she softly said enough arise for much we need without disguise ourselves explain onegin hast forgotten yet the hour when fate so willed we met in the lone garden and the lane how meekly then i heard you preach to-day it is my turn to teach forty two onegin i was younger then and better if i judge aright i loved you what did i obtain affection how did you requite but with austerity for you no novelty is it not true was the meek love a maiden feels but now my very blood congeals calling to mind your icy look and sermon but in that dread hour i blame not your behavior an honorable course you took displayed a noble rectitude my soul is filled with gratitude forty three then in the country is it not true and far removed from rumor vain i did not please you why peruse me now inflict upon me pain wherefore am i your quarry held is it that i am now compelled to move in fashionable life that i am rich a prince's wife because my lord in battles maimed is petted by the emperor that my dishonor would ensure a notoriety proclaimed and in society might shed a bastard fame prohibited forty four i weep and if within your breast my image hath not disappeared know that your sarcasm ill suppressed your conversation cold and hard if the choice in my power were to lawless love i should prefer and to these letters and these tears for visions of my childish years then ye were barely generous age immature adverse to cheat but now what brings you to my feet how mean how pusillanimous a prudent man like you and brave to shallow sentiment a slave forty five onegin all this sumptuousness the gilding of life's vanities in the world's vortex my success my splendid house and gaieties what are they gladly would i yield this life in masquerade concealed this glitter riot emptiness for my wild garden and bookcase yes for our unpretending home onegin the beloved place where the first time i saw your face or the solitary tomb wherein my poor old nurse doth lie beneath a cross and shrubbery forty six twas possible then happiness nay near but destiny decreed my lot is fixed with thoughtlessness it may be that i did proceed with bitter tears my mother prayed and for tatiana mournful maid indifferent was her future fate I married. Now I supplicate, for ever your Tatiana leave. Your heart possesses, I know well, honor and pride inflexible. I love you. To what end deceive? But I am now another's bride. For ever faithful will abide. Forty seven she rose departed but eugene stood as if struck by lightning fire what a storm of emotions keen raged round him and of balked desire and hark the clank of spurs is heard and tanya's husband soon appeared but now our hero we must leave just at a moment which i grieve must be pronounced unfortunate for long for ever to be sure, together we have wandered o'er the world enough. Congratulate each other as the shore we climb. Hurrah! It long ago was time. 48. Reader, whoever thou mayest be, 
Foeman or friend, I do aspire to part in amity with thee. Adieu. Whate'er thou didst desire from careless stanzas such as these, of passion's reminiscences, pictures of the amusing scene, repose from labor, satire keen, or faults of grammar on its page, God grant that all who herein glance, in serious mood or dalliance, or in a squabble to engage, may find a crumb to satisfy. Now we must separate. Good-bye. 49. And farewell thou, my gloomy friend, thou also, my ideal true, and thou, persistent to the end, my little book. With thee I knew all that a poet could desire, oblivion of life's tempest dire, of friends the grateful intercourse. Oh, many a year hath run its course since I beheld Eugene and young Tatiana in a misty dream, and my romance's open theme glittered in a perspective long, and I discerned through fancy's prism distinctly not its mechanism. 50. But ye to whom, when friendship heard, the first fruits of my tale I read, as Saadi anciently averred, some are afar and some are dead. Without them Eugene is complete, and thou, from whom Tatiana sweet was drawn, ideal of my lay, ah, what hath fate not torn away? Happy who quit life's banquet seat before the dregs they shall divine of the cup brimming o'er with wine, who the romance do not complete, but who abandon it, as I have my Onegin, suddenly. End of Canto the Eighth End of Eugene Onegin